And we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live stream about AI. I'm your host, Markus Hofstetter, and I'm a wet photographer. I also shoot uh, digital uh, stuff. I write for a magazine. I'm interested in AI. And with me today is uh, Boris Eldaksen and Shane Balkovich. They will introduce themselves in a few seconds. So uh, I'm looking forward to have a great discussion today. It goes as long as we want, or at least three hours, I guess. <laughs> and now uh, start with Boris. Hello, good evening from Berlin. I'm a visual artist. Uh, I worked with photography for 30 years, also with video and installation. And since uh, early last year, I have been experimenting with AI. And now I spend all of my time um, researching, experimenting with AI and creating new work using my knowledge and experience in photography. Yeah, my name is Shane Balkowicz, coming to you from Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, I own Nostalgic Glass Wet Plate Studio. I'm a wet plate collodion photographer. Uh, Marcus and I are both practicing this uh, photographic technique from 18... Uh, 1851. Um, I'm an analog photographer and um, I've been making um, images, uh, silver on glass images for nearly 11 years. I've got uh, plates at uh, 71 museums as of last uh, last week and uh, it, it came to my attention some months ago and that's how Boris and I came to each other's attention um, that uh, people were making these AI images which I thought were rather fascinating at first um, but then uh, looking into it a little bit more, um, they were mislabeling them. They were calling these photograph, uh, these these images for photo photographs, and I immediately um, took offense to that. I started writing some articles. I've written uh, four articles for Petapixel. Um, one article on um, AI is not photography. Uh, I did a, a second article. Um, on um, what this is going to do for our history. A third article was, um, you know, is, is this kind of art form AI, is it considered art? And then I just finished up a fourth article on um, these AI uh, fake people online, that these uh, personas that are being created and, and pretending to be uh, real people. So um, a, uh, Boris and I have talked before numerous times and on different uh, podcasts and different shows it just didn't always seem too like short. enough time always too short even even our longer uh, talks just seem too short so we came up with this idea that we would just get together find uh, you know someone to uh, narrate this and kind of sh uh, kind of just give us an opportunity to talk back and forth about what what our thoughts are um, and I'm just approaching it I've got no real expertise. Um, other than just being an analog photographer that um, has been uh, trying to understand and make my way through this this journey. Uh, wonderful. Just, well, what? Uh, please. If one, if one, so one uh, short moment. Uh, we'll have a list of topics. I'm going to share them uh, right now in a moment. Uh, there should be a button for that, images and browser. Yeah, here is our topic. Uh, Flipboard was so kindly to host that and to, to make some advertisement for that. And uh, the first uh, topic is, uh, as Boris wanted to start, uh, about his work. And uh, I'll just open uh, the website uh, with his article uh, from The Guardian. And I have to agree to the cookies first. <laughs> And there is Boris's very famous, Boris, you should explain this image because this is uh, probably the most, one of the most famous AI images of uh, uh, in recent times. So um, it's rather fascinating. So uh, I'll leave the uh, website open for a minute and then Boris, you can start already. Well, the electrician is uh, over a year old now and it was created in over 20 steps using dal e2 which was the best thing to use last year last summer and i handed it in into photo competitions in autumn to find out if they are prepared that it's going to happen and they have not been and uh, to my surprise i was selected as the winner of the open category for the sony world photography awards and when they told me, I told them that this was a test, that it's AI generated, that they could disqualify me, or if they would like to continue, that it's very necessary to have a debate on the relationship 
between AI-generated images and photography, but they didn't. So uh, after a failed series of communication, I decided to refuse the award uh, publicly on stage at the award ceremony, which I did. And uh, I had no idea that it was becoming so big that it went first viral on the internet and then global news, and uh, it still hasn't finished. So this is it. But what I wanted to do is really to clean up the terminology and to start a debate. What is photography? What is AI-generated images? Uh, funnily enough, um, after my uh, refusal, I got many new followers from traditional photography on my social media channels and AI artists. So for both of them, it was kind of an important moment first to say, no, it's not photography. And then for the people that worked with AI to say, maybe it's something new, a new discipline that has its value and it's just about to emerge. And I have been thinking a lot about um, the differences between photography and uh, promptography, how I call it. And the biggest mistake people do is only looking at a result, saying it looks the same, why don't we call it the same? Mm. I had a discussion with an AI artist today, he still thinks AI photography is a good terminology. And <laughs> we are going to have a debate about this next year in April when we share an exhibition. But uh, I think even if it looks the same, you can have a plastic lemon and a real lemon and they are different things. So the difference lies in the workflow. And if we go back in time for the motivation, why does someone become a photographer? What does photography mean? And what does promptography mean? Why do you want to work with AI? And maybe that is a good starting point for the conversation and possibly my question to Shane and also to Marcus, why did you become a photographer? <laughs> what is the essence of photographing for you? Uh, for me, um, and I can't speak for Marcus, but for me, it's about capturing the moment. And I, I find it very interesting. And, and, and now we have some terminology like promptography that we didn't have when we first met, right? Like that was the first thing that I was arguing is that um, I don't know much and I'm no expert, but I know that this is not photography by definition we are not using light to make these images. So, uh, and that's where that's where the you know the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and it, it said, yeah. "Well, we have to uh, these 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 AI images are, are all well and good, but um, you know the people that are making them have to take it upon themselves to figure out their own terminology, and we got to need a new category. By all means, I have no issues with an AI category as far as art form goes. I'm I'm not one of these guys that says what's art, what's not art. I mean, I've always pushed back against that when there's gatekeepers. So the last thing I want to do is be a gatekeeper. But what I do feel is that this, I, what I do know in my heart is that this work and the electrician here, um, no matter how mesmerizing it is, it's not a photograph. And 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 people have pushed back on me some very strange ways, uh, Boris. I think I ex shared to you once before where. One guy argued that, um, you know, computers use fiber optic cables, the fiber optic cables use light, and that's how he was going to <laughs> go, around, go around the corner of this argument and say that, um, you know, these computers are actually using light to make these, these images. And, and it just <laughs> it fell flat on its face as far as I'm concerned. So um, people will try to justify however they want. But that was my first article is like, like this, we know for sure. And, and when I first posted that article, there's a lot of people not agreeing with that position. And then I've, I've seen over the, the following months that more and more people are really acknowledging that, yes, it's, it's not a photograph, stop calling it a photograph. But if you, you know what, when I first uh, did that article, there was 187,000 and there's probably 10 times more than them now. Uh, of Im images on Instagram being called for photographs. Um, yeah. And um, they're using the words photographs. And, and I asked um, I asked a gentleman, I said, why are you, you know, this is great. I, I love your image, by the way. I love your image. Um, but why, why are you using the hashtag photograph or photography? And, and he says, it's just, a, it's a tool to get more likes. And that, that's how he, yeah. he justified it. So that's, that's kind of where we're at when we're all just uh, uh, trying to get likes. Um, 
you know, some crazy kind of things can happen. But um, I, I always felt that um, it was interesting to me that the, the electrician got passed. I mean, the, these people on this panel, they were they were experts, right, in the field of photography, right? I mean, the Sony Awards. It was. I mean, let our li- listeners know that these are this is a very prestigious award that you won with this. And you're not. The yes, only but one it was won. it. It was only one jury member. Yeah, for the okay. open category, okay. I wasn't, I wasn't and sure. that poor man had to judge a couple of categories. So okay. I don't blame him. He he never wanted to give an interview, so I mm-hmm. have no idea. And if you have to look at all the images and you judge competitions, how much time do you have? Um, but well, uh, I think it's more interesting to talk um, who is using the term uh, AI photography and why. Um, I think it's mainly non-photographers. Yeah? Mm. And they come then from the end and say, well, it looks like photography. I call it like this because it sounds cool and it's a hashtag that is established and is going to have more reach. But yeah. I find it more problematic if professionals do so. Mm. In summer, I've been at a photo festival in Arles in the south of France where everybody comes it's an international meeting point and i had an evening with uh, two festivals um, and myself debating um, how to continue in the future and there was one festival in sydney who said it's not photography yeah it has nothing to do with us we are not going to accept that point and there was another festival in israel who said I don't know. I'm curious to see. Let's wait what people are going to hand in. And I said, did you adjust Mm. the guidelines? Are you transparent? Are you inviting people to hand in AI-generated images? Are you using the old regulations? And they have been using the old regulations. Mm. And I said, it's a mistake. You need to have a clear position. You need to exclude or include it in the guidelines. Anything else is bullshit. And I think that is a homework that festivals are doing, have been doing, institutions, curators do. Um, What I see is that uh, photo festivals love to have AI somehow included, but they became more careful uh, Mm. in finding the right terminology, uh, in, in separating it and putting it into a different basket, which I like. I recently yes. was a judge for an AI com- competition in Australia. And um, when they came up with the idea, they wanted to call it Camera Peculiar. <laughs> and I mm. said, I'm, I'm not going to be a judge for Camera Peculiar. There is no camera involved. There's no camera. It's, it's totally misleading and you need to think twice. And it, it wasn't bad intention or something for them no. to come up with no. this terminology. It's, it's thoughtlessness, and I think it's about often saying it's not photography, you need to call it something else, uh, that we all have to do. And it was also a process for myself. In the beginning, uh, my, my first exhibition in January this year, showing my AI work from last uh, year, um, was called AI Photography by the organizers. Mm. And today I would not accept it anymore. Mm. In January, everything was new, everything was busy, and it kind of like slipped through my attention. Um, But yeah, I hope that together we can create uh, an awareness for the difference and, and work on the details. Yeah, that's what we're seeing, though, aren't we seeing it? We're seeing it in Facebook groups where um, the, you know, the people that are uh, running the face, different Facebook groups like uh, Frames Magazine comes out with a formal statement about, you know, that they're not going to allow AI in, into their group. We, we've, I've seen more than one photography magazine fall. I was following this photography magazine. They were going to put one of my Native American portraits on the front cover, and I won't say who it was. Um, but I was following them on Instagram, and then all of a sudden, these AI images start appearing. And um, you know, he was trying to uh, backpedal, and 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 after it was called out that this this isn't phot- photographs, and how can a photography magazine actually be promoting, um, you know, promoting this? Uh, um, they should just know better. And and um, 
it was back and forth, back and forth in their position. They continued to share AI images uh, and they're a photography magazine. So if a photography magazine can go sideways on us, I, I think most uh, most anyone can. But I, I think we're seeing a lot of more rules put into place, a lot more. Every, any, you know, I, I submit my work for, um, you know, for different exhibits and stuff all the time in different contests. And you, you I, I think it's pretty hard now to find uh, there isn't some kind of uh, statement or um, fine, fine wording at the bottom that talks about AI. Either it's uh, uh, available or it's not available. It can be used or it can't be used or to what extent it can be used in the photograph. Um, it gets all really kind of um, gets kind of murky when when uh, you know these are digital images. A lot of these and they're not analog photographs. So with digital images, um, you know, with generative fill and stuff, you can add all kinds of stuff to your to your output. And uh, so then you're arguing what percentage of it is AI and what percentage of it is real yeah. work. And it gets really kind of difficult. So, so. Yeah, and, and that is not solved in the future. I think Photoshop had a big impact on um, yeah, photographers in accepting um, the new technology. It was just one more tool, right, Boris? I mean, they just brought on a, a, a new tool. It's just one more button on the screen uh, amongst thousands of buttons and features in that, in that application. I mean, what a robust application it, it just seems really easy for them just to add this one little and I, the example i can give for the um the, the audience is that I, I saw this uh this photographer take a picture of a skyline of new york city and they posted their put their camera way up high on a building and took this 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 land uh this portrait of uh the downtown it was and um then he decided that he wanted to uh, make it into a landscape instead of in portrait mode in landscape mode. And um, he just had Photoshop add buildings left and right, and he stretched out his image. So now we have real imagery of the skyline um, on that given day, the real light yeah. that bounced off those buildings. And now left and right, we have buildings that don't even exist. And will never exist, and and that and that can be fun, and and we all know this kind of photography, and and collages and stuff have been used for, you know, ever since you know you, you can go back to the history of photography back in the 1800s. They were they were taking um, glass negatives and, and mixing them together, um, and uh, making these collages. That's that's all well and good, but um, you know it's the history part that kind of bothers me. Is that if that image of the New York skyline on that day gets out somewhere. You know, someone in the future may think that those buildings on the left or right really did exist. Yeah. Yes, then, but uh, that that. Sorry. Please, Marcus. Uh, the for example, this was a good example that they put glass plates together. Like uh, we are wet plate photographers, and uh, Le Gray was was collecting clouds. I think that he put in his landscape images, or was it Archer? I'm not sure anymore. And uh, this kind of uh, stuff always was there, but now it's a little bit different because now you can like generate it, uh, prompt it, so to say, uh, uh, by yourself. And uh, before we change topics again, I um, want to go back to your uh, question, Boris. So why I like uh, photography? Uh, I started with sports back, uh, back then, and then I did some commercial stuff and uh, I saw the evolution of people doing more and more uh, Photoshop work that looked so portraits or images looked more and more like paintings somehow. And there was more and more post-processing. Uh, like I said, post-processing was always a thing. Like if you look at the work of uh, Ansel Adams, for example, he was the master in the darkroom and he did a lot of post-processing. But somehow I, uh, at some point I was overwhelmed with all this stuff and I just wanted to go back and uh, uh, take photographs and that's why I chose my way to analog and uh, I shot a lot of portraits on the street. I did a project where I worked with people on the street and that's the main thing I really enjoy in photography. I really enjoy to work with people together. I like all people. I think they're all beautiful and they have their all they have like uh, their own beauty and I try to capture that. And that's something I enjoy the most in photography. And now with wet plate, I think that's something where I just have the final product in my hands. And for sure, it's something uh, I think Shane can relate to that. We are working with our hands. So I've seen some uh, black stains on the hand of Shane. That's from the civil nitrate. Uh, uh, 
It's not necessary that I need to work with the wet process, but I chose that process because it's like my favorite process right now for portraits and I'm starting now to do prints. So uh, maybe I, I will change a little bit more to la landscape as well. But I also can shoot on film, for example. That's something I really enjoy. I still shoot uh, digital and in my most talks, I will say the camera I use the most is my iPhone because it's just like that. Bec because when I'm on vacation, why should I take like a big camera? I just want to capture some memories. And then we are back again to AI because every time you press a shutter on an iPhone or you press the button on the iPhone or any uh, cell phone camera, it's all generated in the background. It takes maybe seven to 10 images and with AI, they choose what to make brighter or darker, or even uh, some cameras yeah. uh, will uh, put in something in there that's not in there, like uh, uh, some of these super zooms that capture the moon, for example. It's just an image that is projected uh, uh, in your own image. So we have already AI everywhere. And one more thing, I started to get uh, interested in AI with, uh, like you, uh, Boris, with Dali. I wrote the first article for CD, for Heise, for the CD uh, photography magazine about it. And I was really excited. I was really, uh, I really liked what you could do. But to, honestly, I got bored pretty quickly. Then I, I changed to Mid Journey and I thought it's pretty cool as well. What I want to do now in the future, future is I want to install a, a Linux computer. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll try it, uh, some AI that runs locally on my device. That's the next thing I want to try. Yeah. But as you said that so much AI is part of the technology we use, I think it's very important to go back to the motivations and to, to try to figure out the difference. So my thesis now for us to debate is the following, that the majority of photographers they go out into the world. They are present at a certain place with certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And then it is an interaction. And if you work with people and you both are portrait photographers, you need to have social skills. Yeah, You need to get to create an atmosphere mm -hmm. where they open up, where it becomes a mutual portrait. Mm -hmm. So um, that is something, all of this, I don't need working with AI, no. but um, if you think it till the end and leave the mainstream AI image generating and the, the prompt engineers that do it for jobs, um, I'm working with myself here. I can be in a dark cellar. Yeah, I have no connection to the world. Then I do an inner journey if I work with text prompt. Everything mm -hmm. I want to have a, as an image, I need to put in the text. I work with my experience. I work with my um, self-reflection that I have. Uh, what kind of image I would like to generate? Why? What are my influences? What are my preferences? So each image I generate becomes also a mirror of my own psyche if I do it for myself. And that is... I think uh, one possibility to have a definition where you say photography, you go into the world, you are present with people at a location and for promptography in the end, uh, that presence is someone you have with yourself. It's an yeah. inner journey. And that's very simplified. Of course, if you are photographing in the world as a photographer, you should have a reflection about yourself as well and so on. But I'm trying to uh, dig deeper to make it easier to distinguish the motivations and the workflow. Do you think a lot of people think about that, Boris, though, when they're just, no. I mean, you, you have to understand there's there's different levels <laughs> to this game and, and your AI and what you generate is, is so much different than, and then just people just going out there and just generating image after image. Uh, you know, I hear the argument all the time. They, they, this is, these are the justifications. Well, they did this, you know, one of my favorite photographers is uh, William Mortensen in the 1920s. He was photographing witches flying over tops of houses. Well, yeah, he was. But both both images, he had to take a picture of a witch and he had to take a picture of some houses. And he was able and to luckily meld them he together. was working on film sets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, but there, there's all kinds of justifications. And 
And as we, I mean, if you, you know, you talk about moving forward, if you take this forward enough um, and people do this enough, we could be at the point where we have more artificial photographs on like, for yeah. instance, social media than we do real photographs. And then we have to ask ourselves, what are we left with? Like, what, what, what does that look like? What does that landscape uh, look like and and will um is is that something that uh, is is the internet in is the world improved is it better by having this influx of um artificially generated imagery um just wash over like an ocean wave over um over reality that's a good uh, um, good point uh, shane just uh, uh very quickly Uh, I saw a video today where somebody explained how to create uh, YouTube shorts with AI and make money with it. So he created like uh, some sayings, like 50 videos in, in two minutes and uploaded it. And that's, I think, what Shane was referring to. Uh, if we It's just the volume. Have... Yeah, It's it... the volume. I yeah. mean, William Mortensen spent hours and hours, if not days, on these collages. Um, and, yeah. and now you can just do it and it's going to get easier. You know that, Boris, right? I mean, it's just going to continue. To it is, easier. but, but let's face it. We are living in capitalistic societies. And okay. if you think, does it improve the world? Does it make the world a better place? Did cable TV make the world a better place? I don't mm. know. There are many things that just are driven, uh, by money. They are new technical inventions. And uh, if I look at the majority of AI-generated images, I find them utterly boring. If I look at the majority of images that people take with photo, with cameras, I find them utterly boring. So the mm. difference for me, according to the quality, if it's photography, it's not better in it by itself. Yeah, um, mm. Just be photography. Uh, the main thing I subscribe to is it needs to be transparent what it is and you shouldn't fake it uh, for whatever reason. Yeah, if the common denominator just clicks, um, I, I'm not sure where that where that really leaves us. Um, But doesn't yeah. that mean the main problem is social media? Yeah, the main problem Because... it, it very well could be. Everyone yeah, because this be. is this is this is what a head uh, um, programmer of uh, stereo diffusion said in a talk that he thinks it's not the AI generators, it's social media that is a problem. And I, I think um, you know we see this all the time. We see artists, um, you know, we see people in their basements painting and picking up a, a paintbrush and a canvas, and and you know it never goes anywhere. I don't, I don't have any problem with people creating. I mean, that's that's great, but I I still think it's at the end there's going to be this less than one percent of people that are actually going to be really successful, actually be able to make money, maybe actually be able to exhibit their work, maybe or you know make publish a book. Uh, of AI works. I mean, it's going to, there's only so many Sally Manns in the world. And, yeah. um, you know, there's always going to be this. So I think you've talked earlier about like, you, we've given tools to people that really didn't have any talent in any particular way. And they're able to become um, artists rather quickly, like very, very quickly. And, um, and I think your argument has been before is that you, you know, as an artist yourself, you're going to be responsible for picking up these tools as well and, and, and using them in your own work and to elevate yeah. your own game, because this AI is going to bring everyone up to speed rather yeah. quickly. It's going to put everyone on a, on a, on an even footing, and then it's going to take some time for the Sally Mans of the world, um, to, to float above, uh, the, the minutia and the, the, the glut of all, all this imagery. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very complicated and very nuanced. Uh, I think when we talk about uh, what you just said, Shane, uh, that it's very similar in the other photography as well sometimes, you know. Uh, and maybe it's not really the same topic, but it's uh, like similar where people uh, like get awards or get a lot of attention with uh, a photography, a plate, an AI image, but it can be anything where you get lucky because uh, you just put in the right prompt or you just pointed your camera uh, to the right position at the right mom uh, moment and got something interesting. Um, 
And what I see is uh, when people use a lot of AI, it's very different to the work that Boris does, but he explained his world, uh, workflow uh, before. Uh, in very short words, what I can, what I want to say, you can get lucky with all techniques. It doesn't, uh, you can get lucky with a wet plate because you have a lot of oyster marks, like a lot of, art, a lot of uh, uh, artifacts. artifacts, thank you. And uh, some uh, jury will like it because it likes unique and you win a prize. Uh, but that's not gonna uh, work forever for you. That's what I mean. You can. No. Yeah, you can't replicate it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So do we want to go on with the next topic? Which sure. On the list, like me, let me share uh, the topics on next. Uh, yeah, this, I think it's interesting. The problem with uh, biased AIs and how to make AI better. So uh, that's about like uh, maybe racial topics or uh, topics, female, male, uh, there's a lot of different things happening, like ChatGPT wouldn't, uh, uh, at the beginning, wouldn't tell you a joke about uh, women, but about men, for example, something uh, that was, for sure it changed already, but I think uh, um, the, uh, the topic is clear what we uh, want to talk about. And yeah, let's start. Shane, you want to start with this topic? Yeah, well, there was uh, it, there's a bias. So I mean, there's you know the pro the problem is is that these AI programs are going to get into the hands of the elite, and the elite are going to be able to create whatever narrative they want, and and they can push these. Uh, apparently, they you know with ChatGPT, they can push these um, these uh, artificial intelligence into certain directions or exclude certain things. And you know when you, if you anyone who's experienced with ChatGPT has tried it. If you ask it certain things, it will just refuse to answer certain certain questions and stuff like that. So, um, you know, with AI, we, you know, we could talk about photography. I heard about, um, you know, that there, uh, you know, you can take this to the extremes where, you know, you're not supposed to submit or it wasn't. Do you know this, Boris? Was AI trained on nudity at all in photography? I mean, did, were they able to exclude nudity? Um, the open source model that used uh, Lion 5B training data set from Lion, also uh -huh. like a nonprofit organization, yep. they included nudity in all of this. And they had a very interesting reason saying um, if you want to have proper filters at a certain time in the development, you yep. need to have it in the training material. Otherwise, how can you train the machine to detect all of those things? So that makes sense to me. And you're mm -hmm. talking about uh, the power or the misuse of bias because of this, the open source models exist. Yeah, Stable Diffusion was created from people working at two German universities. The open source data set comes out of Hamburg. Um, they are transparent and they said, we don't want that the, the decision power and also the computing power is only in big tech. Mm -hmm. And one option to control AI or one strategy like I read it was to have many competing AIs. And we have many competing AIs now for all the models that are run by Google or Microsoft and so, so on, we have open source alternatives where the world can contribute. At the same time, it can be misused yeah, and it has less control. So there's a positive and negative side. But talking about bias, I think um, it is my responsibility not to accept a biased result. I need to decide what I would like to get out of the machine. Mm. I know and I see it often in talks that people use uh, image generators like an oracle like to tell me about the world. And I'm, I'm typing in school teacher. I've, did the, I've done that two a year ago. School teacher in stable diffusion was always female, white, around 40. Yeah? So yeah. it's typical bias. But yeah. then they, they tell me, oh, that material is biased. All of this material is biased. And um, A, I think it's going to change if it's done by the companies because they need to 
uh, to be able to compete in the markets, the different markets, and B, you have uh, local initiatives that create their own biased uh, versions, like in Japan, yeah, where they say, <laughs> you didn't think of our culture and language, we do it ourselves now. Um, this is all going to happen. And then we have the choice which one we use and if we accept the bias or not. Um, I'm not using uh, generators as an oracle about the state of a certain society or training data. There was and, a, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, one thing to finish, the, the, the training data of all of those um, providers uh, uses English language. So everything started in English. This is so that's a already, bias right there. that is a bias. bias just according to the language. So there's one thing we uh, we should think about is uh, that even Kodak back then uh, had to adjust uh, the film to black skin at some point, you know. It started with, with color film. It's, it's maybe, you know, but it's a similar thing. They had to adjust it uh, over time because uh, black skin was always underexposed. So they invented a new film stock and that was uh, made uh, dark skin uh, brighter. So no. it's maybe I, I, maybe similar to what we're experiencing here now with uh, bias the eye. This we are just at the beginning, or it's like one year now. What would you say, Boris? About one year that that it's very popular, but uh, image generators, yeah, last summer. Yeah, but uh, I don't have to say that much about bias. I think it's going to be solved uh, in exactly. the future. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the reason I asked about the. If whether or not the training data included nudes, because I, I read a, I saw an article about, or it wasn't even an article, it was a post where a, a mom fed in a photograph of her adult, like let's say for instance, 24 year old child fed it into one of the AI um, photo apps and uh, asked for it to bring back a photograph of her child when she was 12. And uh, it produced a photograph of her child nude, um, which was rather startling. Um, that the, the dad is there. Uh, she didn't prompt it to add, you know, she obviously didn't ask for the, to see a photograph of her 12 year old new child. Um, but there, uh, she just fed it and it just, this was part of the, what it decided to bring back to her. It's a context. And I often uh, get nudes in mid journey as well because of the mm. context. Yeah. Where I don't have the aim to create nudes. There are workarounds to do so. Uh, but it, it happens now and then. And if you use stable diffusion and the old uh, 1.5 uh, uh, version, you can create whatever you want. You have a not safe for work community on uh, stable diffusion, which is called unstable diffusion. They have a, a browser-based generator that you can use for free and you can create any kind of porn you would like there. And that is available for all of us. Um, and as, as a parent, I mean, you know, the, the child pornography uh, industry would be something that, you know, these are the nefarious reasons. I mean, I just have to point out some of these nefarious things um, that, you know, you just see even as, um, as innocent as a mom just asking to see her daughter when she's 12. And then it brings back some, some pornographic image of her daughter is, 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 is it's a concern. And I don't, um, I, you know, that's why I asked you, I wasn't sure how much nudity was in the, the training data, but it would seem there has to be if, if these are the results that you're able to get. Yeah, but it's it's still always complex. If you talk, talk about like pornography, child pornography, uh, you can use um, those uh, machines to create fake child pornography. Mm. So you could say it's awful because it creates more of this shit in the world. Or you yes. could say... It's a good thing. Maybe that leads uh, uh, to a production that is virtual. So no children need to be harmed anymore and exploited. Mm. What is yeah the, the good side, the bad side? It's not so easy. And I, I talked to, to someone about pornography in March, and he said, if it's still so complicated, which it was in March, to, to produce convincing images, it might be cheaper to shoot it. Uh, but I think uh, that time is over. It's very easy and, and cheap to produce nudes today. Mm. Uh, so it's going to affect the porn industry. Mm. 
definitely. Okay. It's probably enough about porn, Marcus. Um, <laughs> should we, I should we talk about that? Aspect. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, but, but it's a big disappointment of myself uh, because years ago I had a project that I never did that was about alien sex. Um, what I realized uh, in, in AI used for pornography, it's so boring. Yeah, It is repeating all the cliches of the porn industry where you, mm. now you could say, hey, I can create any body, any life form any genitals and go wild but no us humans need to stick to the old categories we know there is nobody inventing anything that is is unknown mm. that is my disappointment maybe we could uh, we could jump to this uh, my, the fourth thing on our topic now that we're talking about fake people and and yeah. not not so much pornography but uh, my fourth article on the topic was does the world need images of fake ai people um, so I, again, I was on Instagram and this, uh, this photograph, yeah. you know, I'm very visual as a photographer. So when I, when I see things visually, I, they, they really strike home for me. And, and this, this young, uh, this young girl, if you scroll down a little bit, Marcus, you can show what Mia, so this is Mia here. Um, and she's got a last name and a first name. And I, I looked at her immediately and I, 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 you know, it, you know, if you're scrolling on a little iPhone, you don't really see right away that she's AI, which is a problem for us, right? Like, I mean, it's getting harder and yeah. harder. Um, so, but then you, you know, I start right away. I looked at her and I think, oh, she could be AI. So then I look at her back at her catalog of images, and and sure enough, you look back just you know three four weeks, and you could find that Tamia definitely is not a real person. So I yes, decided and that her that. hands are always hidden. Her hands are always hidden, and. Um, you know, her cup size changes from one day to the next as well. So there's these just these telltale signs that this is not a real human being. So, um, you know, so I uh, wrote this article and then what was really interesting and and this story is yet to be told is that uh, Mia reached out to me and uh, the creator of Mia and um, she's out there on Instagram and what she's doing is she just posts the photographs of herself in a bikini, usually, you know, with some cleavage and her butt showing and these kind of things. And the, um, like this is the most the, the one in front of us right now is the most tame photograph she has. Um, that was her. That's her initial photograph introducing herself to the world, um, by the way. And um, so now you can um, you know, she interacts. She, you know, people respond. Men are out there. Obviously, a lot of men are out there. Um, there's two categories of people that are interacting with this 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 fake person. Um, and again, we don't know who the creator is. And I'm trying to get down to the bottom of that. Um, but there's uh, men are making all kinds of comments about Mia acting as if she's a, a real person, um, wanting to marry her. Um, I mean, just the the craziest. Con I mean, these are not um, these are comments that you, they are acting like she's a real person. Um, and then the other people that are interacting quite a bit with Mia are other fake AI people where they are. Um, we talked about this before the show. They're bouncing back and forth with each other, um, complimenting each other. They'll actually take, you know, they'll meet on the street and they, they'll take both the AI personalities will meet up at some point and they're they're constantly complimenting each other. And and some of the conversations that are being had out there are crazy. So Mia reached out to me and I'm going to have a conversation with the creator of Mia, um, I think, on a Zoom call this Wednesday. So I posed 25 questions to Mia. She she came back after this article because I, I did not have to worry about, and this is, goes a little bit to one of our other topics about the copyrightable, um, and Petapixel wasn't worried because, you know, she can't have the rights to the, the likeness of Mia, so we could share her image all we wanted. Um, I also, uh, Steve Lease was able to, if you go back in there again, Boris, if Steve Lease was able to take Mia himself with the, very, very quickly and was able to generate his own Mia so you could steal Mia, this this likeness, all you want. Um, so if Mia gets some kind of uh, large following, uh, anyone in the world can just go ahead and and steal her likeness for their own purposes. Um, it, yeah. it, it gets really kind of it gets really kind of weird. But she said that there was more to the story. Um, after she read my story, she said it was a good article, and I made some good points. One of the art points I said, well. The creator of this could be some overweight, bald man in his mom's basement, or it could be uh, my other example would be an 80 year old grandmother, or it could be some 13 year old gamer who made this this uh, persona up. Um, but 
the, the point is, is it's generating, trying to generate revenue. So you can buy me a cup of coffee, send her $5. She's got a list of, uh, you, you know, she's got a list of items that she likes. You can buy her lingerie, you can buy her chocolates, you can send all this stuff, uh, spend money and send it to this fake persona. She has about 7,000 followers um, since she started this a couple months back. And um, she answered my 25 questions very nicely. And I'm not going to share them with the world until Mia can prove to me who she is, because I just think it's, you know, I'll just be criticized for just more false information. If she can prove to me who she is, then I'd, I'd love to tell their stories. And she was very thoughtful in why she created. And apparently this is a female photographer um, that made this. Uh, it's not some man um, behind the scenes that made this persona. Uh, the, there are a couple of ways how you can create such a persona, and I would be interested how she has done it. You can uh, create uh, little models, I would call it, on stable diffusion. Mm -hmm. okay. Fifteen images would be enough. Yeah. So I, if I have fifteen images of you somewhere from the internet, I can regenerate mm -hmm. you in stable diffusion. Mm. Uh, or you do a face swap. And then you need just one picture frontally, and that's easily replaced on any image you generate. That would be possible okay. as well. So you have this kind of likeness that sometimes is a bit changing. Mm -hmm. because, and the body is different because you, you don't focus on the body. You just right. focus on a certain appearance, and then the face is set in. Or you could uh, use a, a model that someone else has trained and and work with this there are always multiple ways to create something like this but um isn't it something like stock photography that we have been fed from advertising and the media for years yeah people that are not authentic and it's always been a, fake yeah it's always yeah. been fake for us it has always been fake. I have, I have been no. Listen, I had a very fine, fine moment uh, this week going to the big uh, photography fair in Hamburg. Uh, the, last year, I was the only one talking about AI. It was my first talk, and uh, this year there was a whole conference on it. And there were people from an advertising agency, it's like one of the top five in Germany, okay. uh, showing what they do with AI, and um, then from the audience someone asked isn't it a problem that with ai you are losing authenticity don't you need authenticity in advertising mm -hmm. and i was laughing out loud <laughs> yeah, and then the guy from the advertising agency was looking to me and was, was clapping his hands and said i love you boris because there is no authenticity in advertising. It has always been fake. I remember when I finished my studies, I didn't know what to do. I became an assistant of a commercial photographer for th uh, three months. Then I stopped because it became unbearable. But I've learned a lot. Yeah, They, did, uh, um, uh, they shot a campaign for Vitra Design Furniture from very south of Germany. So that was moved to Berlin. Then they were looking for a location and that was a kind of white cube Bauhaus style <laughs> architecture that they could get from a rich, uh, I don't know, banker to, to, to shoot in. So they put the furniture into this place and then they needed a model. And the model was a student of English uh, literature who had no money, was 27. They bought him, or they, they didn't buy, they just lent his whole outfit in, in two of the most expensive uh, shopping areas from Berlin. So they dressed him well. They He sat at the table and two of the art directors were sitting there. You only saw the shoes and that was shot. And he was more or less my age. And I thought, if I look at this advertising, I think, what did I do wrong in my life? Yeah, that I'm not there. But all of this was just fake. Advertising has always been fake. Yeah, and uh, as we are living in a capitalist society that is heavily relying on advertising, that fakeness has always been there. I don't, 
uh, I don't know. And it, go, it, it extends to Hollywood too. Hollywood's always been fake. We all know, you know, the the the, the view of Marilyn Monroe and who she really was, and we know that uh, how she was portrayed is not was not reality. We we know we see these supermodels without makeup on and stuff like that. These these photos get leaked or they share them themselves, and we find out well that that's really it. It seems like it's fake all the way down. Like no matter how deep you drill, it, it's been fake for way before computers were generated, it was, it was, it's always been fake. But, um, so I, I, I guess the argument would be, what's the difference, I guess. But lately, I think yeah. uh, uh, if you look at TikTok or uh, all the different Instagram postings, it's uh, uh, a lot more that uh, people like you and me are uh, with fake filters, with smaller faces and, and all stuff like that. They influence so many young people and young people uh, maybe get uh, psychological problems because they think they have to look like that. And uh, I think this is also back to me, uh, that's also an issue that can happen to uh, people that are prompted, so to say. Uh, then other people think, wow, she's so beautiful, uh, I have to look like that, I have to get bigger eyes or bigger lips, I don't know. And there's a lot of... Uh, uh, stuff happening like beauty operations or something like that uh, for young girls or even i don't know boys maybe in the age of 18 right now or 18 or 19. so these companies that were targeting uh like uh people in their 40s or 50s to make them look younger are targeting now younger people because uh, uh there is the need for that right now and i think this is very scary I yeah, the filters on phones have been, I mean, that's been a problem. How long has that been a problem, Boris? I mean, I got to be honest, like when I I have people, a bunch of people out to my studio and, and you know, a lot of these people are strangers. I've never met them before in person. So the only, the only imagery that I have of them before they come into my studio is, you know, I look on their Instagram, I look on their Facebook page and then, and then, you know, so I, I, I want to be, you know, if I'm going to create with someone, I want to be inspired by them and kind of have an idea of who's going to present themselves to me. And they'll come to the door and they knock on the door. And I open up the door <laughs> and the person that the, a, the, the online uh, persona that this person has been, uh, you know, putting out there in the world, they look nothing like what I've, what I'm, what I've been looking at. They, they, I mean, I'm starkly different, like completely different. And, and it just, it just, um, so I, I it, it, again, it just, I don't mean to be the old codger that's just complaining about, you know, um, you know, people have called me a Luddite that I, I, that I just don't understand this technology. And, and then the other thing they say is, well, um, well, there's nothing you're going to do about it, Shane. It's here to stay, right? Like why you, why you continue to co complain about this, Shane? Why do you continue to bring these things up? You're just, you're just, you know, going against the grain. You're just an old at 54 years of age. Your your shelf life has expired, and and I should just uh, walk off to the nursing home because I don't have re any real perspective. But um, it, it's not that I I'm having a problem with change. It's just I mean these are the things that um, the, these filters um, they they've become just uh, commonplace for people. And I guess we we really don't want to know. Um, what we want, what we look like. And, and that's what I love about what plate photography is that it's, it's very revealing. It's, um, it, you know, it's very honest in some ways. Um, yes. You know, but, but, it's, um, you know, but then, then people argue, well, it's not color shane. So how honest is it? You know, it's, it's black and white. So you're, you're missing all kinds of information. But you have to prepare for worse. I'm sorry to tell you. This is a human being now creating a fake persona. But in the future, um, we have a, a large language model. We have chatbots. Those mm -hmm. chatbots will be able to remember our conversations. So I can have a relationship with a chatbot. That chatbot is listening to me, listening to all my problems, having conversation with me. Mm. I can easily fall in love with this AI chatbot. And that chatbot can also um, get looks yeah so and and can be put into a machine into a robot that will all be possible and um having those conversations with chat gpt when it started earlier this year people already thought it's a living being it's some some force from outer space that is bigger than us and they didn't mm. uh, understand that it was just mathematics and probability and word added by word. 
according to probability. Um, this will happen. Yeah, right now I can say there is a real person behind me. Yeah? Isn't that good? <laughs> In the future, there won't be a real person behind me. Yeah? And, and when I started sharing Mia's story, some people were confused, Boris. They actually thought that she was an AI, like she was, I had to explain, no, Mia is generated by a human being trying to be someone else. Sorry, guys, and just, I had to, I, just, just a quick interruption, because uh, uh, Boris said that people will talk with AI or they will remember what's, what's going on. I shared the story. I just want to put it in here very quickly. I shared the story with you guys, and I will uh, look up the link. I don't have it right now. Uh, that uh, a guy on Reddit posted that I remember sending it to you that uh, uh, a guy on Reddit uh, feed, uh, fed uh, ChatGPT with a lot of information of his mother and so uh, his mother passed away and he said to, uh, goodbye to his mother uh, with uh, writing uh, about his issues or his, not his issues, sorry about the, the, word, the wording He was riding with GPT so he could uh, say goodbye to his uh, her, uh, his mother, and I think that was really something very different. And I think that's something uh, Boris uh, uh, tried to explain or uh, tried to say that this gonna happen ha will happen in the future, but it's happening already. And that, but it happened. It happened 150 years ago. We know this, Marcus, because there was spirit photography. Like there was these photographers that were photographing people, and then these ghosts, and then they would, they'd actually be in the room and see the him wave the sheet and stuff, and they would still buy into it. Um, so the psyche and yes. and and, and, yeah. and the cycle, you know, how we view things, or it's always been done. There's always been, you know, ghost photography in the in the Victorian era was very very popular, and people believed. Um, that these were uh, these were real ghosts that were entering the frame and being captured by these photographers. And these unscrupulous photographers are taking advantage of that and making money off this uh, this phenomenon. I have a collection of those at home in a library that is um, only about this topic. It was inherited by a friend of mine who was one of the possibly the German expert in spirit photography. Mm. So if you ever come to Berlin, uh, come by. But what I... Let, let's make it broader. Um, okay. uh, anything can be generated that is digitalized. And we are now talking about photography, but with voice, it's the same. Right now, we have applications where I can talk in, in, in Polish, in Spanish, in Italian, in Arabian using my voice, and I have no accent. And then if I record it in German, I upload it, it's translated, and later the image is manually manipulated in a way that it's lip synced. So that is possible. You can also have uh, our talk now and cut out two minutes. And in the two minutes of me talking, you can change 30 seconds. <laughs> mm -hmm. And however you would like it to be. And the rest is authentic and is me. And those 30 seconds are done by you. So those things, they are all possible today. We can use it to for big disinformation and we can use it for different things. Like if we talk about the, the man who wanted to say goodbye to his mom, yeah, um, we can all talk to our dead parents if we have a voice recording of them. We can feed the voice recording, have them be generated, give it to our therapist. <laughs> He's talking with the voice of our parents to us. Uh, I don't know. All of this is possible. And what I find uh, frightening and exciting at the same time is that we haven't uh, even uh, started to um, come up with ideas how to use it, good or bad. It's still so fast. Uh, how those features arrive, those possibilities, that we can't process it. What are we going to do when Vladimir Putin appears on on the screen and says that I, he just launched nukes towards America and we all have like 14 minutes to, to live? I mean, we're going to have to, and this goes back to what we had talked about earlier, is that we're going to have to, this, this information's got to be identified somehow, it's got to be watermarked. Because Vladimir Putin saying that I just launched my entire arsenal of nuclear warheads towards America um, in, in, in a believable fashion, a video, perfectly edited. Um, it's a problem. And, and, yes, and you know, the good thing okay. is 
he would not announce it. He would just do it. So if there's an annou announcement, it's fake anyhow. I know, but that's you. You're, you're rational. You're intelligent. Yes. You think through these things. You get it on YouTube and there is going to be a certain percentage of the population yeah. that is going to believe this as being fact. We already know that. We are. We see things as simple as Mia fooling gentlemen. Okay. If there's people making, I mean, proposing to be married to her and, and asking, can I meet you in New York City? I'm in New York City next week. Asking Mia, I'd like to see that happen. Like, I'd love to have my wet plate camera there to capture Mia being sitting next to, uh, you know, this person that wants to meet Mia. Um, we're already buying into this, Boris. It's yeah. all just a, a fabricated fantasy world. And um, my, my only thing is, I just don't know where that leaves reality. And I don't know where it leaves history. And I don't know where it, you know, it leaves uh, the shoebox of photographs for, you know, uh, the, for my daughters and my, and my son. I mean, I just don't, it, what, what are we, what are we going to do? It will, it will be making history more complicated because uh, so far for historical reasons, we needed photography, writings, real documents. And now everything is digital and can be generated. Um, it is more complicated in the past. And I don't know, I don't have any answers. I see that there are multiple um, attempts to shape this, to uh, create technical options to be able to distinguish between generated and non-generated. If it's metadata, additional metadata, if it's watermarks, or to create um, symbols yeah, out of America in October will come the light, uh, Writing with Light initiative okay. uh, from Fred Ritchin, a Magnum photographers, American universities and others that set up a code of ethics how they work as photojournalists. And they created an, an icon like the copyright symbol that they put behind their photographs. So you can see that, okay, it's done by a person that subscribes to this code of ethics. But all of this can be copied, misused. AI will just remove it. You're just trying AI uh, to remove it. They're already removing remove. watermarks for photographs and, and, and an yeah. AI image will generate and then someone's inappropriate watermark will appear down in the right-hand corner because the AI thought that, well, hey, a lot of these things have these watermarks. Um, it's got to be in the, in the file. The, the, the main problem that, that I see is that the things that have been possible in the past with efforts and skill can be done today with no effort <laughs> and no skill. Um, and then uh, spread very easily with social media. So social media uh, needs also to be part of this round table. It's not just a question of AI generated images. We have to rethink social media and how it works. For sure. I, I know Google's trying to figure out how to embed some kind of watermark inside the file. So even, I don't know how that happens when you, you know, we can just capture screens all day long. I mean, you, yeah. know, the, the, you know, that that data doesn't come across. Yeah, there, when you there, just is, capture a, there is a technology for that. Uh, I will see if I can post a link uh, later on it. Uh, there is uh, a company who is specialized in digital mm -hmm. watermarks that are kind of an algorithm in the picture. So basically, even you mm -hmm. can figure it out on a screenshot. I will see if I find the link to the software or to the company who offers that. The company initially, that was long before AI, uh, said uh, made it for copyright reasons. So you have like an image that is worth a lot of money and you, uh, before you put it online, you put it free, uh, through the service and then you can find it very easily without comparison of images just because there is like this algorithm in the compression or I'm not sure how they, they do it. And this would be uh, pretty cool if uh, we could use something like that, but I don't think it's going to be happen, to be honest. I have a, a good friend, uh, Carl Sovak from the University of Mary. Um, he's the dean of the business school out there, and um, they have to put all, all papers, all written papers, because of ChatGPT, they have to put them all through uh, this program. They they pay they pay for this service that uh, comes back and, and reports, okay, that's 90% of that's AI and so forth. And um, it's just normal course now that they, they have to, uh, 
they're having to regulate this and try to uh, keep in check um, their students because they're given, obviously they're given the writing assignments and um, the students uh, can just ask their homework to be done rather quickly with ChatGPT as we know. And it's it's only going to get better. It's only going to get so better, I but there's already- I just share it right now. Go on. Shane. Invisible watermarks are patented technology, okay. Um, so I, I, I see this as this was a solution for, uh, you know, visual work, but then, you know, you gotta be, uh, we got the problem with, you know, the written work as well. And, and like I said, people are already addressing that and trying to, uh, trying to negate some of these, these uh, students that are just, uh, I, I can't imagine for us. I mean, if you were, you know, my instructor and I was paying you $20,000 a year to get a degree and, and that I would just like use some program to write some article for me. I mean, at some point, none of the learning is taken on there. I mean, I, I know this is a totally different topic, but it, it's crazy to me that uh, a student thinks it's a good idea to use AI to do their homework and, and not get any of the knowledge for themselves. Well, um, that, I don't know. Uh, some people would do, some people wouldn't. But um, if we go away from ChatGPT back to image uh, generating, yeah. Um, I also see the technology as useful in teaching. Um, once the students have understood that um, with a certain uh, knowledge of terminology, of, of a technical past of references, they can improve the results. They have a motivation for themselves to research and to learn. And there are platforms out there that show you how daguerreotopy has been looking like, yeah. How all techniques have been looking like, and that is something that that drives them because they know this is I, I need that knowledge to make a difference. You can also mm. um, use it for any kind of um, art history classes. I had many teachers in my workshops that um, work at at high schools and also write articles for the the teachers' magazines and create the books you use in class. And they realize as well, it's it's a very good tool to, to test if you have understood a certain um, art, um, uh, what's, what's the call, um, um, certain form of art. If you have understood what is Baroque, what is Renaissance, <laughs> mm. yeah, so, so you need to 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 use certain terms, and when you say I want you to create a Renaissance picture of blah blah, but don't use the word Renaissance, <laughs> then then you really have to show what 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 else do I have in mind according to Renaissance. I think it can be used in class. It it can be a motivation. Um, the students have a disadvantage in AI image generating because they have no experience and no knowledge. And that is what you are actually working with if you want to get below the average level. Hmm. It's a lot to think about. So we got, not only we have students using AI to to do their homework, we, we could potentially have, uh, well, we I'm sure there already are teachers that are using AI to generate their syllabus and and their papers and their tests and and so forth no they are yeah already, and and there uh, i'm uh read on reddit that there are teachers they are checking if students are using ai for their homework and uh there are teachers that will check the homeworks uh, from students with ai and there are students who uh, use the same website to check if their uh homework is done with AI, but they didn't do it with AI and it was recognized as an AI. So this is like an endless uh, circle of uh, failures and success. And, but it's, I think it's part of our time right now that people try to uh, figure out if it's done with AI or with ChatGPT, with, with something else. And others try to uh, cheat the system, so to say. Yeah, maybe you should have different forms of homeworks then. But yeah, um, there you go, categorizing again, right? Like we we set, separating it. Yeah, 
Um, one one thing I would I would like to suggest um, because uh, on one side you have the doomsday scenarios, but it could also have a positive change. Um, I was really impressed by uh, a study going back in time and looking at the chess computers, uh, an, an old form of AI, where mm -hmm. at a, a certain moment in history chess computers have just been stronger than humans. <laughs> Correct, and we haven't so, we haven't won since. We yeah, but we could have stopped playing chess and saying no, nope, that's it. We are not playing chess anymore. We 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 are inventing a new game. But they continue to play chess as humans, and they trained with computers. And if you look at the level uh, on which chess is played today, compared with the level chess was played before chess computers, it's much higher. So. Couldn't that be possible also with human creativity that through working with AI or having all those things written with ChatGPT, we kind of internalize. This is how I could have done it in the past, but I was too lazy or I had no clue. And at some point you understand it and it's part of your knowledge and then you can move on. And I think it is possible that through um, AI creativity, we have also an augmented creativity. And maybe let's talk about uh, creativity between humans and machines right now. The main problem I see in the debate is that everybody talks about a second step out of three steps. To be creative with a machine, we need a first step to define a prompt. What would we like to have generated, and then the machine generates step two. It can do it without me. But then in step three, I have to look at the results. I have to evaluate. Is it good enough? I need experience to evaluate. Um, do I want to continue? Do I need to change the prompt? So I go back and refine step number one. Do I need to change the workflow and in invent something else? So out of those three steps, Two of them relate on an informed human uh, that has an experience. And we only talk about step number two, the machine can generate an image. And that this is one point that I would like to, about, to say about creativity. Also, my role as an artist changes working with a camera or working with AI. When I work with a camera and I'm out in the night, it's like, I'm one with the camera, with the place, with everything. I'm also like an instrument, yeah, like I'm a, a singer. But when I work with AI, I have the, the, the training data that is an endless choir <laughs> of voices that I don't know. Yeah, and I'm the conductor and I need to somehow create something out of that uh, dissonant choir to put it into harmony. Yeah, but you come back. You you were the person that actually, without you being there, it, it never those 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 captures never would have occurred. It, it it's occurred to me that um, what we do, and I had that little example. Um, you know, I asked people, and and you participated as well. To if I have the idea of this moon, I had this. I did this wet plate of this this lady with this moon head, and I asked people, okay, if this was the idea in your head can you generate it in AI? And we found out rather quickly that it's rather difficult to do that. that like if, if you have a specific idea in your head and then ask the AI uh, to do it, I, my, my point is I think a majority of people are just asking AI to present something. Oh, they may not like it. Okay, present something else. And at some point when they, they present something that they just, oh, that's good enough. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. When that's not exactly what they were thinking about at all, they just claim it for themselves and say, I made this. And that's just for me that there's that's fraught with error like that that just just because it got close that's not the same process as me when I'm in the studio and I I have the lady with the moon on her head and I'm I'm composing the shot I'm actually composing that shot but when AI is just one more one more giving you one more rendition one more rendition oh that's the one yeah that's what I was thinking and then you can claim it at any given point for us you can just acknowledge that's what I wanted and there upon that declaration. It's yours. It's bullshit. 
Um, I agree. Yeah, there is a big difference between typing in five words and being happy with the result or take, spending more time on it. But uh, just to come back to photography, mm -hmm. um, I did stage photography over 25 years and I started with having ideas in my mind and then you try to execute it. You have the same problem. <laughs> Somewhere you are stuck and you think, true. oh, this is not how I imagined it to work. But the beauty of the creative process is suddenly you see a uh, plan B <laughs> and you follow plan B and the result is even much better. You, you could, couldn't, have, couldn't imagine the, the, the outcome a day before. And that for me was always the beauty about the creative process, that it is an element of chance, of surprise, of changing plans. Um, I never created photographs that I had in my mind 100% before. It would be boring. And I see this element of chance also working with AI. Okay. I, but yeah, I think uh, that's what, we, what I talked before like the element of chance you have in all kind of photography it's maybe all kind of image generation like in no maybe like let's stay with photography because people just can't get lucky everywhere and and yeah. then they they claim uh, that's what they wanted to do and and for me that's okay but it's it's i think boris it's not your way and it's uh, for shane it's not your way as well because we have ideas in our head we want to create yeah. something and then we work until we we find uh, uh, our solution or we find the image that is bouncing around in our uh, mind and then we uh, make a physical product so to say out of this this idea yeah. If it's repeatable, if, if, I mean, if the talent is able to repeat it, if you're able to find some consistency, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing, right? We all can get lucky, but you can't get lucky every Friday when you're making f photographs, you know? Um, and I, I think you can just get lucky a lot more with AI. Yes, yes. But I think you can only repeat, repeat things if you work in a studio in a controlled environment. If you work out in a world, it's chaos. You can't repeat those things. And uh, I have a list of uh, arguments that uh, photographers brought up against AI. Maybe we okay. just go through them because it's very interesting be because I can, I can use those arguments also against photography. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. um, so, so, so one thing we already started, it's unpredictable. Uh, that's what the U.S. Copyright Office says. It's unpredictable. I have been photographing uh, over 20 years at the center of Berlin, Museums Island at night. It was always unpredictable. And that was the beauty about it. Yeah, you go to the same place over and over again, and I'm always surprised. This is what I loved about photography, that I go there, I know the place, I don't know what's happening, who is there tonight, what they are going to do. And I come home with images that I could not predict. Yeah, so I think that is something that uh, it shares with photography. The second argument is just connecting things. <laughs> and uh, this is what photography does as well. Yeah, even if, if you are out in the street and you try to make sense of this chaos, you need to connect foreground, middle ground, background, the light, yeah, the focus, whatever. And if you are in a studio environment, yeah, you have more control. It's the same. Yeah. And um, one oops, uh, argument, it's not real. Um, what, what is reality? Yeah, I think um, in your studio, is it reality? You work with real people, but you have a prop maker. Yep. Um, so these people are not wearing those things all the time. It's not their mm -hmm. usual outfit. Is it real? Yeah, but is it um, real is always the question with film, with digital. You put, you press the shutter and Canon uh, uh, will decide how your reality looks like or Nikon decides how your reality looks like. So I think that's, that's really a poor excuse to say it's not right. real. It's nothing is real. I see a color red differently that you may see the color red. That's so yeah. reality is very relative, so to say. Yeah. And then the next argument is uh, skill must be earned. And you also mm. have uh, f f cameras that are on full automatic 
or very simple, or you photograph with your smartphone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so what level of skill are we talking about? Uh, AI uh, image generators can be very complex, and workflows can be very complex. And this is something you must learn. It's not just uh, throwing in four words into the prompt field and click generate. Uh, you Mia, can do it. just just to, just to back to what you're saying there. Uh, Mia, the creator Mia, also said that she alluded to how much time she has to spend to get exactly what she wants Mia to look yeah. like, just for those those very, you know, superficial photographs that she's sharing out there. Um, that there's there's a lot of stuff behind. She's got hours and hours into into getting Mia presentable before she's able to uh, to share it with the world. Yeah. And then you have to think it has no soul um, because it's all like robots. <laughs> um, I think me as the, the human person uh, using the tool needs to put that soul into it by the way I'm guiding it, the decisions I make. Um, it has no soul is also something that Painter said about photography when it was young. Uh, and you are lazy and failed painters, and it's the downfall of art. Isn't doesn't the date stamp the date and time and even place? Those are not even anything to be considered with AI anymore. I mean, those are those are important things. Like I can grab a 150 year old amber type off my shelf here and show it to you, and and we can say, oh, this is so and so. This is who took it. This is the time they were. They were standing here or they were in this city and and we have at least some information with ai it seems to me that we we the very important aspects of photography they no longer apply i mean date yeah. and time doesn't doesn't mean anything doesn't yeah. mean anything to nobody cares what date and time or where or where is where was mia created let's just go back to mia when was mia that last photograph of mia on her website i mean do we care that it was Saturday? Do we care that the creator was in New Jersey, wherever she's at? I don't know where she's at. No. Um, do we care? Do we care about anything? I mean, Mia can be a swimsuit model a hundred years from now, Boris. Yeah, yeah, but uh, honestly, in mother. my world, she could be a mother. She can have children. I mean, she but can isn't chil- isn't it just the 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 the, the date and time? something that only is important if it's about photo documentary. Um, uh, If I don't know your background and your history, and I look at your images, they look like they could be very old, but you've done it last week. What about date and time here? Isn't that confusing also? Well, it's why I call my Native American series a, nor- a modern wet plate perspective. So I kind of tip my hat a little bit and give a, give it away. But I, I, I understand that. Uh, I understand that. Um, yeah, I think uh, I have to agree here a little bit with Boris because uh, if it's like a documentary, something for National Geographic, or if there are, there's like the uh, the uh, piece of art here in Austria, there's also a lot of uh, uh, documentary photographers uh, photographies. And then you have like it's done in Ukraine on that on that date and stuff like that. But if I would create something now on my, uh, if I would create something now in my studio, uh, something like that, I'm not sure if it's really important for myself to remember if it was done at nine o'clock in the morning or ten in the evening, because it's anyway in my studio. What do you think, Shane? Is it uh, important to know that it was done 2022, your last portrait, or it was done 2023? Yeah, for me, it's it's all important. It's all important, and I don't. And, and I'm not. I, I agree with Boris on, on my work that I is not everything. I mean, my Native American series is a documentary piece. You know, I am trying to document these people as they present themselves. I mean, I don't even. Um, to keep the integrity of the series, Boris, I don't even introduce ever an article of clothing. You just can't take a spear from my changing room and and it, bring it into the scene. You can't. There's just I, I, they either bring it or they don't have it. So I, I'm trying to keep the yeah. integrity of that. But for me, um, you know, these people were with Shane Balkwich on this day and this time. And, and for me, there's value to that. Um, I just it just occurred to me with this conversation, listen to Boris, is that date and time really don't doesn't matter 
I mean, it doesn't matter. And we know that from, um, you know, we know from people that have taken historic photographs. There's that one, I can't, maybe you'll remember it, Boris. There's that one famous photograph of the soldier that falling down the hill with the gun in the air. He got, mm -hmm. he got, photo, you know, he, he, it was supposed to be captured real time. That photojournalist captured Kappa. that. Yes, Kappa. And it turns out that that was completely staged and, and that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a true reality either, even if you did have the date and time. So, um, yeah, I just, it, for me, it's, we can only look at us when we go into the future 150 years ago. And, and as a person that has a lot of plates and I specifically spent a lot of time getting places for my work will be around some, some time from now, you know, looking back, it's important, the date and time, it's important. I mean, was this World War One or was was this World War Two, Boris? I mean, when yeah. was this? I mean, wh when what when did this occur? And um, it just occurred to me that there's there's no fucking date and time. <laughs> it, it's it's not it's not relevant whatsoever. It's not relevant whatsoever to uh, to if you're doing portraits of Mia. I mean, it's just not relevant. Uh, just one quick thing. Maybe it would be interesting to hear some thoughts from the audience who are watching. Just uh, if you have thoughts about sure, waiting time, uh, just put it in the chat. It would be really interesting to uh, read your thoughts, guys. What should we look at next, Boris? I think uh, that's really good. Let me let me share the uh, image the images. So we have now. The, then we have. Uh, the copyright thing about uh, the Hollywood. Uh... Do you really want to get me into a rant uh, on Hollywood again? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there was these, these actors are now pushing back and they're saying that my likeness is my likeness. And, um, you know, we just saw this in in um, Indiana Jones, right? We just saw them take Harrison yeah. Ford and make him three, four different age Age, ages in the movie and using it and 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 our actors and actresses are seeing this and saying well if i give enough data about myself to the you know to hollywood they can yeah. make a movie with me in it 100 years from now and maybe yeah, but I'm that, not, that's, family's not gonna... that's not something that surprised me like uh, yeah Puss Nothing Willis. surprises you, Boris. God, God, you know, but <laughs> it, I, I looked at Indiana Jones, this was painful. The story was, was predictable. Painful. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it's going to get better, Boris. You know that. Jones. No, it, it got get, worse. It's and get better. The, 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 the big question I have to Hollywood if anyone from Hollywood here is listening, mm -hmm. how many videos, uh, how many movies did you do with, with Nazi villains? Yeah. Uh, if you really have Nazi villains in the original version speaking German, and I watched the original, and you only have 20% of them really speaking German, and the rest is some kind of gibberish, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't it be better if you don't find someone who speaks uh, German in Hollywood? I think there are plenty. Then uh, get an AI on top of this American actor and mm. have him speak proper evil Nazi German. Wouldn't that be something I expect from a high profile production like this? With that budget, so, you would expect that. So on many, many aspects of Indiana Jones, I saw those cheap, I don't know, uh, I didn't see the value. I was bored. I was utterly uh, annoyed. Uh, I saw, yes, there's the young Indiana Jones. And it was like, okay, I've loved it when I was a teenager. I've grown out of it. And uh, what I said recently to the American uh, podcast, uh, the uh, uh, B&W uh, photo podcast, about it, because they really wanted me to answer, um, is um, I'm not a fan of Hollywood movies. And um, I think it's as generated as it could be. It can only get better. Yeah. So please use chat GPT or anything else to get out of the same superhero nonsense that I've seen over and over again, catering to the same audience. It's painful. So, yeah, it's, and it was really the painful. Was, is the dollar bill again, or I mean, that's what. I spent money to go into the movie for the last Guardians What's of the Galaxy. Seats? 
butts and seats, my friend. That's all. I mean, yeah. and, and that's why we, we have, the, you know, there aren't a lot of one flew over cuckoo's nests um, yeah. movies anymore. There aren't. But uh, so, I think isn't uh, the thing with the Hollywood strike also, I read somewhere that somebody suggested that the uh, artists should make their own virtual copy of themselves and sell licenses for them. Like, uh, like they have their own avatar that uh, they license and they sell their license of their own avatar to uh, Hollywood or to the film production, whatever it will be. What would you think? There is also, there is also a, a startup doing exactly this for visual artists. It's called exactly.ai, where you can upload your images, you train a model, and then you can license uh, this uh, style of yours to others. So yeah. um, I don't know if this is going to um, take off, but it's happening and it's possible. Um, they, uh, Mia, when I, sh I shared that article and shared Mia's story um, and, and her profile, she was she has to be styled as and I can't remember right now off the top of my head. There's two Hollywood mo um, actresses that she's I mean, if you just put in a photograph of Mia, it, it comes back with these positives of that. She's based off some some actress's face already, uh, a redhead. And, and I, can, I apologize. I don't remember uh, who exactly she's based off of, but it, it appears that maybe um, that actress's name was used uh, initially um, to, to create Mia because she's very, she resembles a, a very famous Hollywood actress. Can I uh, really quick, uh, I have a question here from the chat from yeah. uh, Claire Part uh, Action Group. I hope I do the pronunciation right. Hi Boris, great talk. Uh, Martina here from Ireland. Can you say more about copyright issues? It's coming up with our art students here in Limerick. Yeah, hi Martina, long time no see. <laughs> We've met years ago at a British uh, photo festival. The copyright issue has three different aspects. One is the training data. There are a couple of lawsuits running. Was it allowed to collect, to scrape the training data from web pages? Um, yes or no, that's something that needs to be decided. In, in Europe, you can scrape it for um, research, and this is what Lyon did. But then if that research is used by companies like Stability AI to make profit, is that difference? So these things need to be um, yeah, examined. Then you have the second uh, aspect that we have not been talking about. Um, the main copyright problem in the future for me is the single user. Two thirds of the options you have in image generating is by uploading existing images. Uh, you can use like a picture of an American actor and create Mia, uh, but that image has copyright and I'm just using it. Yeah? I could blend images of Martin Parr and Helmut Newton and I don't know whom, combine it, uh, create something out of it and you can't tell what I used in the making. And that is a problem that I don't know how we can solve it. Nothing of this, yeah, there is, I don't know. Images are scanned for nudity and violence, but that's it. And then the third problem, um, do I have copyright on what I just created? And um, that is also a big question mark. There are local laws, like in Germany, Schöpfungshöhe, that when you can show you had a more complex workflow than just typing in three words, you had many creative decisions, you have been a director, then you are the author. But again, where do you draw the line between you are the author and you have not done enough? Like Jason Allen, for example, um, the creator of the, the opera, space opera image last year in September, he lost uh, in America with the copyright office and he provided like 600 different prompts he used in the making of this image. And they said, sorry, our law is that image needs to be created by a person, not a machine. Doesn't matter mm. how many 
prompts you use and the law is like this, so you don't get copyright. In Germany, he would be the author. So that differs and that also needs to be clarified. But for the arts, copyright doesn't matter. Yeah? It matters who is my gallerist. Uh, is there an edition? Is it signed? And uh, copyright matters if you're talking about products, companies that want to sell something and that then want to be sure that the label of a certain beer is not used for a label of another brand. That's what copyright is for. Is your question answered, Martina? So we have a little delay, so we have to wait for 10 seconds. I'll just uh, ask, uh, read the next thing. It's not a question, it's just a statement from, uh, give me a second, from uh, Melody. I'll just uh, read it right here. Hi, Marcus, Shane, and Boris. I only use AI for Avatar because live streaming, uh, I really don't uh, want people to recognize me. Yeah, that's understandable for some people yeah. who are uh, doing uh, some different kind of work. Not everybody want to be recognized or want to be, if they go, uh, walk on the street, they don't want to be recognized from other people. But it's also a protection for the future because we have our faces on videos on YouTube. We can be mm -hmm. regenerated. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So. There's, there's definitely reasons for it. I mean, there's many of there's many good applications for AI. I would like uh, Boris. I would like to see, um, I would like to see us solve cancer. I would like to see us, you know, solve some of the big problems that we have in this world. Uh, climate change. I would like to see, and um, uh, Marcus, that can prompt us into the the next thing too about the climate. But um, you know, I, that's what I, I don't know why. Why is it that we created, we, we have this fabulous new tool that's so powerful and it's already pa passing the Turing test. And what do we decide to do with it? We decide to just let people make silly little photographs and silly little pieces of art with it. Like I, I, humans like to be creative to begin with. Why, I, you know, I, I joked online a couple of weeks ago. It's like, why don't we train AI to clean toilets and let's leave the art to the artists? I mean, you know, that's kind of my position on this. It's like, why are we spending these resources and stuff? And, and uh, you know, I know that Marcus wanted to address this issue too um, about people are not understanding. Okay, what's the big what's the big harm here? These are just some images. Why do you care, Shane, about these these silly images? If I want to make a million Mias, uh, let me make a million Mias because it, it comes at a cost, and people don't don't think that it comes at a cost. But these these uh, these farms of uh, you know of graphic uh, cards uh, I, I mean they're sucking a huge amount of energy they're using a lot of uh, energy that we could be using either other other places so um, I, I know Marcus is kind of the topic that you want to talk about but and a lot of people aren't aware of it but they they think that there's, there's, there's no cost to this and that's absolutely not true there is a cost yeah cost to, it, um, it starts with, with the all, all the stuff sorry very quick it starts with all no. stuff this is, is running on the internet if you watch tiktok everybody the more people that watch tiktok the more energy is consumed but uh i have uh, i'm sharing now i'm not sharing myself right now but uh, if you go uh like there's an article you sent me it's a lot of things happening i have here it's a little bit uh, small but I have, uh, uh, at the beginning of this year, I found uh, that ChatGPT alone was only was using one gigawatt in January on on, on energy. And uh, Facebook was like, I think, in, uh, I have it here somewhere. It was like, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, Meta was using 9.4 uh, terawatts in 2021. And I think with AI, it only goes up and... Uh, all the governments and stuff is gonna uh, come to us and tell us we have to use less energy and we have to use uh, uh, alternative energy, what is a good thing. I don't uh, talk about against that. I just get my uh, alternative uh, heating. I got it already and I got uh, solar on my roof and stuff like that. So I think it's great, but there's a lot more than uh, only what we can do. There's a lot of what the, all the technology companies can do. Uh, just uh, I, I think we, we all we all agree on this problem. Yeah. 
Uh, there's one that got an answer from uh, Martina. Uh, she said, not sure. There's a perception that any generation is owned by the uh, AI company. Also, attribution, e.g. if you are uh, publishing a series in a book, question mark. Okay, um, so <laughs> the companies, they have all different positions. Um, uh, Midjourney said from the very beginning, you have copyright, but we need to have usage rights because it's running on Discord. Others can see it and can remix it. Um, Dali2 said in the beginning, we keep the copyright, you have usage rights. But then last autumn, they switched to the Midjourney model. And Stable Diffusion from the beginning said, who needs copyright? Everything we do is open source. This is all Creative Commons 1.0. But all of them say, local law apply. Adobe with Firefly and Photoshop said, when they started this year in, in April, we are the first ethically trained model. We only sorry, use bullshit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Creative Commons. That's what they said, and the stock community. And uh, what they did to path uh, the way and for photographers to accept, they said, if you have legal problems, don't bother. Do your job, use our products, and if there are legal problems, we pass it on to our law to our lawyers. So this mm. is the common situation, but all of they say local law apply. But uh, I see ad agencies and magazines having their own uh, AI team since January, and they generate like nothing, because uh, in the end, there is no law just forcing them to make their workflow transparent. If there has been a Martin Parr <laughs> used in the production, nobody can be forced for to 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 show how they work. Mm. So it's it's done. The current situation is complex um, and people have been losing the fear um, that they will get problems in the future. Uh, late in December, it was still like, oh, wait, maybe it's going to be problematic if you just generate something and you sell it and then there are legal problems later and you need to reimburse, so better not use it. And I think that changed with Facebook. And the last thing that you wanted to know was, um, what was the last aspect? Marcus, can you uh, uh, repeat it? So I read the whole thing again, not sure. There is a perception that it, okay, that there is owned by the AI company. Also attribution, e.g. if you are publishing a series in a book, that was the last question. Ah, yeah, publishing in a book. Um, <laughs> um, I always got, uh, especially working with American publishers, um, uh, sheets of paper they wanted me to sign yeah, to, to clear that they can use the image. And uh, none of the, those papers have been um, adapted to the new situation. So I, I should have signed that I own all the copyright and uh, ask all the people on the picture and so on. And I always replied, sorry, I can't sign it. It's, it mm. can't be applied to what I do. The people don't exist. Yeah, I, the copyright situation is unclear. Um, ask law your lawyers what to do and how to quote it. So what all of the American lawyers then came was saying, okay, you just put in there, it's co-created with Dali2, Midjourney, whatever. And I also call it, Promptography, so it's transparent. This is what you can put in the captions. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah t talking about copyright, like right now, like uh, an option would be that uh, the electrician, yeah, does it have copyright or not? Um, that will be a very complex question to explore, differing I from country to country. Yeah, and I think uh, I didn't find the article, was looking for it uh, for uh, this discussion. I saw uh, an image that was uh, generated by Midjourney about the moon landing and it's long ago, so it's it's gonna be different right now, but it was nearly identical to the uh, moon landing from the NASA image because uh, the article said there are not so many images of uh, moon landings out there. And uh, if there are only a little images, so the, the prompt will look very similar to that. 
Uh, I thought it was really interesting. It's really a shame that I cannot show the article to you guys right now because uh, I, l I read it somewhere on a website and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, and one more thing uh, to go back to the Adobe uh, Firefly. I tested this in beta as well and I prepared an article. It was never published. What I figured out is that they said that they use only stock images. And right now, uh, back then, I didn't uh, uh, look looked it up again. Back then, it was uh, like that, that the photographers from Adobe Stock didn't get any money for uh, using their images to learn AI. I'm not sure if... Of course not. Of, uh, of, I'm not sure if... Uh, then no, Adobe said they want to change that. They're working on that. But what was really interesting for me, it was like I went to Adobe Stock and put in Midjourney. And I found like 50,000 images that were created with Midjourney and put in Adobe Stock. So Midjourney for sure didn't use Adobe Stock image, images to create, mid, uh, to create uh, their uh, photographs. But now Midjourney images are in Adobe Stock. And Adobe Stock is used to learn uh, uh, prompting images for Adobe Firefly. So uh, I'm not sure anymore <laughs> if uh, they uh, only use Adobe Stock images because people can upload there whatever they want. It's, it seems, Boris, like we, we, what you were talking about is everyone just keeps putting it off. We'll go back to your, attor you know, your attorneys or it's only local law. I mean, we're just going to have to wait for this to kind of... Uh, yeah. sort itself out where there's some some standards right even international standards of this is this is appropriate uh, behavior and and this and in that and and under the definitions because i mean you can always um, i mean just saying well just pay attention to local law i mean i i think that that's that that's not going to succeed at all is it i don't know for what i do um in the arts it's uh, yeah doesn't matter. As I said, copyright is not a problem here. It's more as an addition and signed. If it's uh, commercial jobs, um, it makes a difference. And then I have a workflow where I can show that I, yeah, I directed it. And I, when I do commercial jobs, I'm not using images from others. I start with text prompt and then I use the images that I created from the text prompt to continue with blend or image prompts so what's next yeah let's uh, uh, see in our list i'll share it real quick on youtube as well so you guys choose we have now okay we did that yeah then we have the adobe stuffers fear uh, its ai tools could lead to jobless reports i'm not sure uh, I don't know if I would like to talk about Adobe. No, yeah, I um, agree. <laughs> let's let's talk about the camera here. What up? How about that? That's a joke. <laughs> and a very clever marketing. Yeah, that we can. <laughs> no. Shane, what? Yeah, you... I, I wasn't impressed with it either. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, it's good. Uh, I think. We talked a little bit of Note Nine about new AI photo app. Um, perfect pictures of themselves. I mean, I think yeah. that's been a problem. That's been a problem for some time now um, that people are doing that. Well, while, while you decide, I'm just getting another drink and I can hear you. I take my earphones. That's good. Okay, perfect. But we can do a, a short bathroom break if you guys want to, like five minutes. Yeah, if you'd like to. Okay, I'll just, uh, uh, we'll be right back. I put in the be right back thing and we will be right back in five minutes. So everybody okay, can recharge ourselves.
so here we're okay. back again and we have we just uh have questions already so yeah let me just boris and i were just talking about something interesting i just said boris um would it bother you if i put the electrician on t-shirts and made a million dollars from it and i i thought it was rather an interesting um response by boris and i i said no because um it's not an artwork and for me what is important that it's like an edition of 10 it's signed by me and if you want to put it on t-shirts or something like this go for it yeah and i want the work to travel but it's a product yeah the difference is my signature okay it's fair that makes sense so uh i have two questions uh first uh Give me a second. Martina had a question, but I want to ask first a different one from Kate Main. Hope, I hope I pronounced it uh, the right way. So she's asking a question. If you enter the same set of prompts twice at a different uh, moment in time and with more images being fed into the generator, will you obtain the same image or is it different every time? So what you need to do to have the same image is you need to use seed. If the platform doesn't offer you to choose a specific seed, it won't work. And a seed is a geolocation in the training data where uh, the image will be generated. And if you use an identical seed and identical prompts and identical models, uh, and parameters, if you can choose between parameters, there are different ways of um, uh, doing the mathematics for the probability, then you will get more or less 95% same images. Um, if you don't have the same seed, it's going to look differently all the time. And each model is different as well. So all these, so all these, um, you know, uh, Marcus and I were talking earlier, all these artists that are out there, you know, it, it's very commonplace now, Boris, to share the prompts, right? Like artists saying, these are the words that I used. Um, and you're not really giving anything away, are you? Because, I mean, you can go and type those, um, you can go ahead and type those exact same prompts and you're not going to get anywhere near uh, what, what that artist had originally gotten. I, I would say that the trend has changed already. It was like this in the beginning. And I always considered my text prompt to be like a recipe that is mine. Mm, okay. uh, and I, I don't give it away. And if, when you try to generate um, the electrician, you can upload it to Midjourney and they have an option called describe. Then uh, Midjourney suggests text prompts to use to generate this image. None of them work. Mm. It only works if you use the electrician as a reference, but then the reference does work. So um, it, it's not an image that was generated in, in five seconds. It was 20 steps and 20 different text prompts and in painting and out painting. And those things uh, do make a difference. In June, I experimenting in combining um, the 1940s language with the history of abstract art, because uh, just recently I had a show in a gallery in Panama that is representing the history of abstract art in Latin America. And I wanted to have this crossover. And you can't get it just by a text prompt. You can't just prompt, I want to have a mix between 1940s photography and the history of abstract art. You get bullshit. <laughs> you have to, to be, meanwhile, experimental, have strange prompts, uh, start with text prompts, use the results to blend in mid-journey, use the result as a reference, add a text prompt again, do it again. And 40% uh, of what I do these days is post-production in painting, out painting, or generative fill. Because I'm not satisfied with the result that the AI is giving me, but I see it, uh, I see the potential to expand it and to change certain parts. So it's kind of an impulse for my creativity. 
uh, but this is my workflow and this is um, yeah my what I want to create. So you're always using Photoshop in the end to to I mean you're never really satisfied with what the machine's never. spitting out to you. Never. What you get never is spread. never what the, never what the machine <laughs> gets out, even if it's a complex workflow. Okay. So uh, we have uh, an that's interesting, sec Boris. A second part of the question. In other words, is the value or generating capacity? Uh, of uh, a word a constant in a prompt or does it shift and change in time as the tools are fed more images i think it will always change because what i it changes with the models mm -hmm. yeah it changes with the yeah. models because at the beginning a lot of people were putting in like f 0.9 or something like that and it was from my point of view it was uh, much more uh, depth of field as it should be with that and then they used like cinematic view and there was a lot of uh, discussion about that. But yeah, I g uh, give it back to you guys. Yeah, I found it really interesting, um, Boris, that you're, uh, that you're never satisfied with um, what the machine gives you and you're, you're, always, you're always tweaking it at the end. So that, that adds another layer of uh, creativity to, uh, to the image and, and um, no, that, that is also my, my problem. And this is why I'm going to work till 2 a.m. tonight. And maybe we, we talk about what I'm doing at the moment. Yes. Um, it's, uh, I, from time to time, people come with commission, commission jobs. And uh, I like to accept them if they are interesting because it's uh, a challenge. Can I solve it? Because there is no handbook for workflows. And I was asked by an Italian magazine to have a portrait of two rappers. Uh, they are well known in Italy. They have a love for uh, 60s, 70s Italian horror movies, Giallo. <laughs> and one that most people might know is Dario Argento, Suspiria. He's still alive and he's shooting the video clip <laughs> of the track they are doing. So, um, the magazine said, we have the two rappers in our studio. We have a professional studio. We can shoot whatever you need. And I said, I don't need a studio. You can shoot them on the floor yeah, with your mobile. Just uh, 10 times their faces, different angles, different light is enough. This is all what I need. Yeah? And they said, mm. yeah, but they are, have a tattooed chest. Looks amazing. <laughs> I said, yeah, you can shoot them bare-chested if you want to, but it will not stay in the outcome. The tattoos will change. Yeah, And then I had to figure out how to produce it, so to work with uh, prompt, text prompt first. So I generate the images of two men in a setting that is somehow related to the history of Italian uh, giallo movies. I can decide what else is happening and the aspect ratio and so on. And then later I do face swap. And that's a, an option that has become easier. So I upload this image of two men that I generated that looks interesting. And then I change their faces. And mm. so there, the real faces are built in. That works better or worse, and I needed really to experiment a lot to get the best results out of it. But one problem is to have the two faces, so it looks like them, and it looks convincing, and then this is the first challenge, and after that, I don't just want to have a conventional picture, even if it's in a 70s movie style of two, two guys, I want to have more, I want something to happen symbolically and that needs time and i realized that it's just not enough time uh, i've been working on this four days five days now and uh, they aim for 10 images um, it takes three times as longer than i expected because i don't want just to give anything that is mediocre to them it's also a challenge to me that's the downside of being a perfectionist so um, it's new, it's interesting, um, and I would like to have more time to figure out more platforms, more tools. 
Um, sometimes um, another job I did um, was very frustrating in in the in the beginning. It was a, a key image for a perfume that was generated with AI, and it was called uh, it is called uh, the beautiful people. And I tried to figure out with um, the owner of the brand, what do you understand? Yeah, in, in with beauty, is it inner beauty, outer beauty? Uh, what kind of people would you would like to have on the picture? Um, and uh, she answered all of those questions and came up with an experience of herself in the pandemic with friends on a Baltic, not a Baltic, on a, uh, a Spanish island, a fiesta party on the beach. And I used this and I generated images with the description. And uh, it, it was very, very, it was a picture we have seen many times, a picture we could use to sell Bacardi, <laughs> chocolate, mm. holidays in Spain, whatever you imagine. And mm. then it took me three weeks <laughs> to use these interim images that are somehow well-known cliches and to tweak it so it becomes something that is more interesting that I can put my name to. And that was also convincing um, the lady. And I think we managed to get there. But it, mm. it's all a learning curve. And there is um, all of us that work with this are pioneers in trying out things. How many people do you think are using this kind of workflow uh, to this extent, Boris? I mean, a majority, like way over 99% of everyone generating AI images is not having this thoughtfulness put into it, not having this these hours, tedious four days of workflow into producing 10 images. I mean, it's they, just almost become don't. a parlor trick, isn't it? Almost like a parlor trick now, I mean, that anyone can do? Well, on one side, you say anyone can do it, but I say if you want to differ, you're not saving time. I I spend as much time mm. generating images than I spend photographing images. Yeah, you would. It would have been easier for you to photograph those two gentlemen, go to the studio, yes. fly <laughs> there, and and shoot them in in the in the setting, and then you yes, could have photoshopped or something. I don't. I'm not sure. But I can put them in so many different settings with so many different outfits and I can put snakes on top and crocodiles and all this shit. Isn't that great? Yeah, it would have been much costlier to get this in reality somewhere. Hmm. So I, I like this aspect that uh, I have no limit. Yeah, it goes back to my imagination and to um, my skills in, in working with the tool. And um, this is my main problem, that uh, I have a tight deadline and I know I can take it much further. And this is why I stay up late and sleep less. Uh, it's just time consuming. Thanks. I uh, hope you have one more question. Uh, there is, uh, I think Martina was it. Uh, any advice on AI uh, video generators? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, um, it's just a, a moment. Can you uh, turn your camera up a little bit? You're a little bit cut off. Uh, ah, that's perfect. Yeah. Super. Thanks. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving around. It's a summer of AI video. And um, for a long time, most people did love Runway. R U N W A I uh, Y, Runway. Um, but I don't think it's the best anymore. The options of runway are limited, but during the last two months, they added uh, motion, uh, zoom in, zoom out, camera movement, left, right, rotating. Um, that became better. But I think the strongest tool to use uh, is Pika Labs, P-Y-K-A on Discord. It's, it works similar to Mid Journey. It also has parameters that you can add. 
Uh, and then you can add camera movement as well, motion as well. And what I just uh, released this week uh, is what they call encrypt. So you can put text into the video uh, that you are driving on a highway and next there's a billboard saying whatever you want to. And that is beta, but for beta, it's it's the best, I think, around. And then it depends on what you would like to, to use it for. Hey, Jen, H-A-Y-G-E-N is um, very good for videos where people are talking or selling products. And uh, hey, it's H-E, yeah, H H E, hey, like hey, Hello. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jen, G-E-N. Um, two weeks ago, they had this, this uh, video innovation that they uh, showed what I described before. I'm talking now in English, and the same text recorded can be translated in different languages and then lip-synced to my appearance. And that is very great if you want to have talks, presentations in different languages. Avatars. For that. They have avatars, but you can use your, your own as well, your own face. And I think uh, what they uh, have is that mix between sync and translation and working with your your real voice. But hey, Jen is just presenter videos. So AI videos divide into different classes. Where do you want, why do you want to generate a video? What do you, do you want to sell a product? Do you want to introduce something? Do you want to generate movies? Do you want to generate video art? So would you, you would use different platforms. What I like uh, in, in Pika Labs and also with Runway is image to video. Image to video means you upload an image and it gets animated. You can't uh, steer what is animated yet. It's random. So often mm. you have to generate 10 of them to get one that is good. Mm. And later you have to edit them in Premiere or Final Cut. But um, in June, all of this was very basic. And now it features come out on a weekly basis. Uh, this is really the, the summer or autumn of AI videos. It's faster than I expected. Don't, don't you expect, Boris, for these large companies like Google and, and you know, Facebook or Meta, they're just going to, as these other companies just kind of uh, make their tools and, and make their different applications uh, and hone their skills, it's it's just inevitable. The money's just going to end up, they're going to just be buying these these little startups up and, and then they're just going to be taking all of this. I, I guess there's really no way of having... Um, all the marbles in one person's box. It, it just seems to me that the big players are going to be in charge of this at some point. And I don't think uh, so, but you underestimate that um, a majority of those tools are open source and that uh, the majority of those tools like Pika Labs and also um, Runway are based on stable diffusion. Okay. I hope you're right. So I have one topic that's, uh, I think, uh, that's something uh, that's not only for AI, but uh, all kind of photography. Mm -hmm. To get back to, to our discussion is, uh, I don't think, or maybe uh, people can just enjoy images anymore. Like there are a lot of groups, they have to have rules that they have to put in their f-stops, the camera they used, whatever and like a lot of analog communities have also this stuff uh, and right now with ai i have the feeling that people uh, assume uh, of sometimes that it's this ai like that shane you did it but i did it as well and and uh what do you guys think do you think people can uh, right now just enjoy an image uh, without thinking how it was done yeah, I had that situation this week where, um, you know, the, the a photographer took a photograph of a little girl with a cat. And I looked at that cat, Boris, and I'm like, that ca there's no cat on this earth that looks like that. The fur was Wasn't completely... It a rabbit? 
rabbit. Sorry, it was a rabbit, not a cat. Sure Thanks, if can, Marcus. Uh, if I can find it. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought for sure it was like I was going to send this over to you, Boris. It's like this has got to be this has got to be AI. It's it's there's just no rabbit that looks like this. And and you know you could see the translucence through the ears, just exactly how you you know you wanted it. It's just like this is just. This has got to be maybe that was a girl sitting there, maybe that, but I know for a fact that this rabbit was not a, a real rabbit. And lo and behold, um, you know, I put my foot in my mouth and uh, someone shares with me a video of this photographer on the set with this girl with this rabbit. And it turns out it's just um, editing. I mean, high, high level editing um, manipulation of the, of yeah. the pixels <clears throat> in Photoshop that, um, and and I, now who are you to say? I mean, who am I to say? You know what what look is good and what look is bad? I'm not. I just I was fooled. So I'm I'm maybe it's just my own um, human nature and my own fault. But uh, I just I like Marcus is saying. As soon as I see an image, I'm all, I'm continuously just like I'm questioning it now. Like I'm I'm I, I want to judge it. I want to say you know. And then if it if it's real, then I, I feel okay about it. If if I feel like I've been deceived, I don't feel so good about it. If they say that it's AI, I feel okay. I don't. I have no no either here nor there on that. I mean, I can. I have friends. Steve Lease. I will call out to Steve Lease. He's been he's produced an AI photograph for each one of my articles. Take a look at his AI work. It's app. I mean, he's a fantastic photographer first of all. But then all of a sudden. His AI work is absolutely fantastic. I mean, he is just making some of the most dreamy, beautiful scapes that I've seen come out of AI. And um, I can appreciate it because, but he's out there saying this is AI. And, but it, I guess it's, it's just like when you're trick, it's like, maybe it's a sleight of hand that I'm having aversion to. Uh, I, I'm not sure how you feel about that, uh, uh, Mark, um, Boris. Uh, no, I think it, it needs to be transparent. And uh, besides that, um yeah um i i'm still interested in good pictures and that is uh it comes second how it is produced and um yeah but there are not that many good pictures around doesn't matter in in in, in which um discipline you are working with so when even if i go to art fairs <laughs> <laughs> the the amount of images that really get me is is uh, under ten percent, under five. When the students come into the studio, I, I've always, I mean, this is years ago. I would, I always told them, it doesn't matter how you get to the image as long as you can get to the image. <laughs> I've said that, and I find myself like uh, being hypocritical now in this in this whole with when AI comes on the scene, and now all of a sudden my uh, I'm my perspective is skewed because. Now I see how my words are a little bit haunting me. Um, no, but why? Why? Because you think it's a shortcut? Because they are cheating? There is no effort? No skill? Is it not earned? Those are all valid. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, um, maybe that's what it is. And it's just a judgmental thing. Um, maybe that's what it is. I'm not sure. I just... Um, I'm sick of being inundated with it all. It, it just seems like it's just like it's just too much. It, and 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 wanting to know what's real and not real. Maybe that's where I'm I'm faltering. That's I, I'm trying to. And, and we've already had the conversation about you know Hollywood isn't real. I mean, there's so many things in our lives already that isn't real. If you drill down, nothing's real. There's no reality. Yes. Uh, Brooke yeah. Shields was never as beautiful as as we all thought Brooke Shields was. Um, you know. Yeah, but that's also a kind of, of liberation. Like, uh, I come from philosophy as well, and I was always impressed by um, Plato's Cave or by the elephant and the blind man, Yeah, that are mm. like uh, Western or Eastern symbols of showing that it's problematic to define reality. Yeah, in the, in the Eastern story, you have blind man that a king puts next to an elephant, and say, describe me what it is. And the one at the lake is saying it's a tree. And the one at the ear is saying it's like a, what do you call it, sailing boats, the big um, sail. Sail. <laughs> yeah. And at the trunk, yeah, it's it's more like a, war, a worm and so on. Yeah. 
and uh, on the tail it's more like a brush. So in, in Plato's cave, it's shadows on the wall that are uh, created by a fire and people walking by carrying stuff. These are very old stories and they are still valid today. Um, and I was teaching photography for some time at the Photography Co uh, Studies College in Australia, which is the oldest school for photography. And my first class was always philosophy. What is reality? <laughs> what is truth? Can we trust this machine to solve this problem for us? So I introduced 10 different theories of reality uh, and of truth. And they are all valid because they start from a certain assumption. And then it's constructed logically. But the assumptions are assumptions. It's like, is man good by nature, bad by nature, or both? Yeah, you can, can construct societies <laughs> on all of those assumptions, and we did. Um, so we all live in our own bubble that is sometimes more or less close or different. Uh, and I think what we can achieve is to become more aware of us, of our bubble, and to be able to put this into words or into images. So my artworks have always been postcards from an inner journey. And because um, I'm, uh, yeah, one being, but I'm not that different to other humans. Uh, there is a crossover. And I think when you are honest and, and truthful to how you perceive yourself, um, that subjectivity can become uh, something that is also open for more people. Yeah, we all share certain psychological archetypes across time and across cultures. And that is what I wanted to achieve in my art. So coming back to photography, showing a place and a time was never important for me. What I wanted to do with photography is to hide this, <laughs> to go out to uh, the, the historical center of Berlin, take pictures there. And later, you don't know that it's Berlin. You don't even know who are these people, what are they doing there? It's full of questions and it's kind of like very difficult to place in a time. That is what I wanted to achieve because I had this fantasy or this idea that um, it allows the work to stay, not to be outdated, to connect to other cultures and to connect to the past and to the future. I was never interested in using art as a vehicle for a certain political position. And that is what most of the contemporary art has become. It's it's what we read as a political essay in papers in the past. It's now an artwork. And uh, that was very difficult for me to place myself because I said, I don't want to comment on this problem we have in Germany, in America, or somewhere in the world. I would like to talk about the human condition that is the source of those problems. And that is what my understanding of art has always been about. So how did we get here? <laughs> I, I, I find myself, you shared a little bit about some of your uh, your things that motivate you. I, I find myself, and, and maybe that this is where we separate, is that I find myself wanting to point my camera at as many people as possible and to somehow document who they are today and now. And, and, and if that's my, if that's my theory and that's what I'm, you know, that that's what's gravitating me towards my work. I mean, I mean, it's obvious why I'm struggling with this and why I, why I have such an aversion to this yeah. because I'm trying to, I want someone to um, know who we were 150 years from now. And you just really, you know, with a lot of this AI output, you just, you're never going to get that. So I, I find myself, I must just be in a more of a, documenting um you know historical mindset and it yeah. would make sense that uh, that that's why i struggle with this and that's why i'm 
I'm always like, oh, this isn't this isn't right. And like just today, there was a, a Native American, an AI photograph of a Native American got into some archive somewhere about this tribe. And, and one of the ladies pointed it out that that's not um, that's not reality, that 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 chief or whatever never existed, never has existed, never will exist. And it should not it doesn't belong in that place. So maybe that's where we're, we're ending up with is we're just we we can agree that um there's different as long as things are described properly there's different reasons for it you've given plenty of reasons for why you use certain tools to do certain things um as long as everyone's up front and and what it is um you know it it should all it should all be uh it should be uh fair game but i I have a question i understand that you would like to to photograph portray many people to kind of like conserve them for the future And you said you would want the people 150 years to to know that what happened today or that they have lived. But conceptually, um, uh, why are you not then photographing with the technology that photography provides today? That's why did question. you choose uh, to uh, work with a technology that is... <laughs> 150 years back <laughs> because um, wet plating is is the is the best way to capture that i mean these these images are made out of silver and i have a tedx talk where i talk about that jpegs are going to change their format and and yeah. you're not going to be able to get this stuff into the future so i i feel strongly that a lot of this digital content has no way of getting into the future sure. um i had done When my father asked me uh, back in the 80s, when I had an Apple IIe computer, he wrote some poetry, Boris, and he asked me to use the uh, word processor to type in his poems and then print them out for him. You got to understand that's a rather novel thing back then. You'd have to grab a typewriter other than that, but it was was a novel thing in 1983 to be using a word processor. And that's how far, so when people call me a Luddite, um, that's my pushback is that I had a personal computer in 1981 um, but anyway, so he asked me to type in his poetry and it was really, you know, so I typed in my father's poems, printed them out. He got a hard copy and I kept this five and a quarter inch disc. Remember those five and yeah. a quarter inch mm-hmm. floppy disc that you could bend and, and destroy. And I kept that. I found that about two and a half years ago. I found the floppy disc. I don't have the poems printed anymore. So I sent that floppy disc off to an world experts. In, the, in, in, in retrieving bits and bytes from media, and there's nothing they could do. There was, there was no possible way they couldn't get one word, one, one, one character of my father's poems from that. And we're only talking, you know, we're only talking 35 years, 40 yeah. years. We're only talking 40 years. So for me, why I do wet plate is because it's a, it's, it's, This image that I made just two weeks ago, this is made out of pure silver on glass. And unless I drop it, Boris, it's going to be here a thousand years from now. I have a hard time thinking that a bunch of zeros and ones in a long data file have a chance of being here a thousand years from now in any form, any shape or form. I totally agree. I'm now working with images from the 1940s. I have the negatives. I have the prints here. It's part of my next show. Uh, Fantastic. it's amazing to to work with this stuff and um, yeah but i also use it as material to continue with ai so my yeah. exhibition is will be two thirds uh, ai generated images out of this vintage photos and 30 vintage photos just to to ground it to say what i'm showing you here it's about world war ii and trauma is not a horror movie it's it's uh, it was reality it is reality yeah it's going to be the reality of the future it's a it's a human archetype and it's very important to have the real pictures i collected them over 20 years you can see like every friday if you will follow my work you'll see me i'm in my dark room i'm holding up a plate i'm, I'm like yeah. holding it up to prove to people right Like, because we're so used to looking at everything on a flat screen and everything is in is in bits yeah. and bytes and in the um you know in these JPEGs and TIFFs and so forth. And it's it's there's something reassuring about that this is an object. 
And so yeah. many of our objects, and I'm not preaching, I know I'm not preaching to, I'm preaching to the converted, you understand this, but I, I think I'm talking more out loud to the people that may be listening is that um, there's, there, it's concrete, it's here, it's in reality. I have to yeah. covet it, I have to take care of it. And um, I just don't think that some of the, it's digital content, it's just, um, it was, it was the, like the, the CEO of uh, Google, it was like 10 yeah. years ago or said, we're gonna be the forgotten generation. That um, gonna, many, yes. <laughs> we're taking more digital photographs today than in the first 150 years of photography, Boris. Yes, but we not, we don't print them out. We don't put them in family photo albums. We so don't. So it, it's going to be gone. Yeah, It's going to be gone. You know it and I know it. Yeah, but um, yeah. So I don't know. We all will be gone. Isn't it? Comforting. I'd like to leave a piece. I'd like to leave a piece of me behind to prove that I was here. Yeah, but you have children. I don't. <laughs> but my children. I mean, even my work. Like in my will, Boris. Um, my work. My my kids can come down here, and they're they're each going to be able to grab four plates that they like, whatever plates that they want. But the rest, I'm going to donate because um, if I give this work, and my my work is it's too voluminous, it would be a burden for my family to ever have to worry about my work. But if they um, if they took it all, they're going to hand it down to their children. So you you argue this. I mean, this is only 100 years, Boris. The, 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 yeah. the, the scenario you're talking about is only 100 years because they hand my work down to their children and then they hand their, my work down to their children. By that time, they don't know who I am. We all know that. And yeah. it's just going to be scattered to the wind or it's going to be thrown in a dumpster somewhere. So that doesn't, you know, the whole you have children, um, you're going to be remembered. I don't, I don't think that works. It doesn't it work. Doesn't. It they doesn't. don't know I who have... I am. They don't care who I am. Yeah, I inherited pictures of my father from his uh, fathers and grandfathers. I had no clue who these people were on these pictures. Because they didn't care to document the date or the names, did they? <laughs> no. They didn't. But, no, but often, often like uh, with the, all the images I have from the 40s, uh, you have a short note on the back. Uh, yeah. If you If you can... Read the old handwriting. You have an idea of something. So I doesn't that have doesn't that have some value, Boris? Isn't that a beautiful thing? I mean, a photograph with the date and time and the person's name is so much more valuable than just a photograph of a nameless. And that's what we're getting with AI. We're just getting people that never existed will never exist. And I'm just talking, and I, I can't, I'm only talking, I'm not talking about other kinds of art. I'm talking about portraiture. I'm talking about any AI generated with a person in it. I just have an aversion to the fact that that fucking person, they never breathe. They don't have blood coursing through their veins. They're not going to, okay. they never, okay. they, they but, never had pain. But, They're never going to die. If you take a, a, a larger perspective, let's, let's leave photography and say AI is not photography. It's generating images. Um, what is the difference to painting, to the history of painting, yeah, to the to, to modern art, where you often have faces on the images that are no portraits. But as soon as we started taking portraits in the early 1800s, we knew what a portrait was. We knew what it we and we we at that in those times it was hard for a portrait to lie to you. Okay, so we knew what a portrait was. Everyone knows what a portrait is. Now we yeah, have but portraits. Portraits in the 18th century. I understand century. that had... some like uh, Michelangelo could have painted a fake woman, and that she never existed. I don't have a problem with that, because I never. It's a painting. I didn't anticipate that to be a real person. But AI is giving us back output that is pretending to be photographs. Yes. And there's the lie, and that's what yes. I'm struggling with. That's what no, I'm no, I totally with. get you. And it's that, a very simple, simpleton yeah. way. I mean, I'm a very simple person. I've got a simple mind. Yeah. That's the problem. I, and I've heard the argument, oh, well, well, you don't have a problem with the Victorian era painters, do you? Because they paint people that didn't exist. Well, who, that, that's not the same fucking thing. Marcos, any more questions from... I want some truth, Boris. I want some truth. Yeah, I just... Can you, see, <laughs> can you see it, guys? I shared uh, the, the comments. You could, uh, you should see it on the shared screen. Okay. I'm not sure. I have to share it again. Or can you st still see it? No, just MC I said. See. Yes, yes. Uh, until the waters rise, and then it's all relative. Okay. Everything is gone. Yes. Okay. 
And Melody it, said uh, she makes prints and albums that take a uh, month to lay out. So they, yeah. this, this is a possibility, a possibility for a digital work as well. I agree. Yeah, But, yeah. And I, and I tell anyone, if you take a, a digital photograph, I mean, print the damn thing so that it, it has a chance of being there. Even on, even on some cheap paper and, and with an inkjet printer, at least it's got a chance of being here 100 years from now. I, and I, I, don't, I, do, I understand I, that this isn't important to everyone. It's just important to me. No, but but if uh, it might stay 100 years, but what a yeah. 100 years, yeah. Uh, at the end, it's it's all relative. Like even the art stars that we know today might be forgotten in 100 years. Like in 1,000 years, nobody might know who was Michelangelo. Yeah, so uh, it is all relative. I think at some time in the future, things will just be forgotten and what we well, kind of think it has been i don't know if there is will it have importance reality. i mean why are we digging up fossils why are we in you know in <laughs> egypt digging stuff up and when we find a new tomb with a with a king in it and we're just so fascinated i mean i i have to think i mean if you if you take it out far enough boris in four billion years the sun's yeah. going to run out of hydrogen and it's going to start burning helium it's going to become a supernova and it's going to explode and yeah. we're going to be gone anyway so um i mean that's not really a way to look i mean yeah i don't yeah, want to look we, at the world that way we talk a lot about the future we talk a lot about the past but isn't that just an expression that we have difficult to live in the moment for sure because this is all we have yeah this is all we have Yeah, that's that's the thing I said before. Just enjoy what you see. Uh, I'm I'm guilty myself as well. If I if I just uh, go to the movies and uh, watch a movie, I'm sadly often a very technical person. I see some mistakes, like something I don't know, maybe uh, some um, uh, special effect mistake or something. I can see that it is generated somehow. I cannot unsee it, you know. And when uh, I was watching, uh, for example, uh, Oppenheimer uh, in on a big IMAX screen, I could totally enjoy it. There was for sure some other special effects as well, but I had the feeling uh, maybe because I just knew it was done a lot with analog photography or analog film, uh, I can, could enjoy it more because I didn't have to think about uh, if it was done with some computer stuff. Or, uh, uh, I don't Deception. know. Uh, I've tried to get better to not uh, think so much uh, about what I'm seeing and I'm getting better in photography. I can, I can just enjoy an image and I don't think anymore how it was done. Maybe if I look at a portrait and I see the reflection in the eye, I maybe start to, to think about the light that was set or what did the photographer think and if there is a rim light or something like that. But mostly lately, I really uh, just want to enjoy the images. But it's not always easy. Like like uh, Melody said here, I asked her. Uh, uh, she's a team leader for uh, for the uh, for uh, guru shots in Canada, uh, and she spends five uh, hours a day looking at and voting for images, uh, and there's not much AI allowed, so <clears throat> she cannot enjoy just the images because uh, she's looking. Uh, to see if they are manipulated. Yeah? And I think that's some kind of issue we have these days, that websites or, or social media sites or Reddit forces you to put in details that are, from my point of view, not important because at the end of the day, it's the image that counts that uh, is good or to your liking or not to your liking. Uh, but it's a personal view as well. But uh, all this discussion about how an image was done is important for myself. I want to work with my hands, but it doesn't mean it's important to anybody else. You know, if somebody wants to just enjoy an image, they, they should. So, so Boris, I, I, I should just ask you a question then and we can maybe finish this up. Is um, Where do you, in a perfect world, Boris, where, where does this end up? What, what, where do, 10 years from now, you know, for a perfect world where good beats bad where where do you see this ai where would you like to see this what, what do you think the possibilities are where would you like to be um it's not going to happen yeah it's um um 
there won't be a perfect world. And philosophically spoken, this is the best world we have. Because if you want to make this world better, you need to take away free will. <laughs> and that is not a better world. I think maybe it's the best world we had. It's not my idea. It was already something that Leibniz was saying hundreds of years ago. Um, um, I consider myself to be a realist. Yeah, I don't imagine that good is going to win over bad and that those simplifications are helping. I think the word is complex and we need to talk about the complexity. I also have no idea where this is leading us to. I see um, problems we need to address. I can't predict the future. People that ask me, so what's happening in five years, in one year? The only thing I can say, uh, in the last 12 months, I was constantly surprised by what is possible, by how fast the development has been, all the new features. And I know this surprise will continue. That is what I can predict. Anything else, I can't. I can't even predict my own life. It has been a wild ride for me the last 12 months, which started with... Uh, yeah, my my partner getting a cancer diagnosis. And because I couldn't photograph last year in autumn like I usually do, um, I started with AI and I spent uh, my time sitting in doctor's waiting rooms playing with AI. And it was good to do it. It kept me in balance and the therapy of my partner is finished and it all went well. But it was also good to to have this for myself, yeah, to have something that I enjoyed. It was fascinating, a new tool, and that it was taking off that massively. It's nothing I could have predicted. And mm -hmm. um, it took off in different stages, and the Sony Award was another level. And I don't know where I am right now. I'm leading a different life than last year. I'm uh, working 12 hours a day minimum. I have a lot of inquiries, suggestions. They are all interesting. Um, I'm. Um, this is the time now where everybody is talking about AI and AI image generating. I'm visible. I'm invited. Autumn is full of conferences and events. I'm traveling to those places. At the same time, I have more exhibitions in three months than I had in a year. I'm trying to manage all of this and to grow and to stay informed and to create my art. I have no idea where this is leading me to. <laughs> I, d I have no idea what is happening in January. How can I tell you what is happening in five years or in 10 years? It is that that's the craziness of life that it's happening. Uh, unpredictable and good and bad things at the same time. And you never know what kind of door is opening. I have been an artist exhibiting for 25 years. I had been an, an expert working in digital marketing for over 20, 23 years. And I thought, I have no idea, I'm 50 now. I have the second or third midlife crisis. Friends of mine died or killed themselves. And I thought, is that it? I invested so much time in my artwork and I'm somehow stuck in a niche. And I'm too old for those agency jobs in the future. So what do I do now? And then suddenly AI comes, <laughs> unpredictable. And I managed to love it from the very first moment moment and then also to to see the potential and to decide that this is what i'm going to do and quit other jobs and have more time to explore it and now i'm here now i'm suddenly uh, an, an an expert and people call me a pioneer and they call me the poster boy of the ai debate and something else and it is all crazy what has happened in the last 12 months. Yeah? So uh, it showed me again, nothing is predictable. Uh, the only thing you can do to kind of get through this life is A, be 
authentic. <laughs> yeah, don't predict that you are something else. And um, use your skills if there is an opportunity to apply them. And for me, this um, moment in time allowed me to use my experience as a teacher, as an artist, as someone that has worked with digital media for a long time, and it all became one. But could, was it possible to foresee this? No, <laughs> no way. I, I could never possibly at 44 years of age sell myself in the position I'm in either finding a camera at that age and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I know you're a busy man, um, my friend. And and the, one of the good things that happened uh, with AI in my life is that it, it brought you into my life. So it's uh, I've been enjoying our camaraderie and our friendship, uh, you know, in doing this. And I, I appreciate you taking the time today to to talk. And, um, you know, um, who knows who's listening today or who knows is going to listen five years from now. Um, you know, it's at least we put it, we put our thoughts down and we, we had a, an honest discussion and um, we were honest with each other and, and tried to uh, understand where, where each other's coming from. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just, would I, very much like to continue this conversation. Yeah. And, and also as a more or less regular comment on what is happening, I think if we do it every three or four months, it's Enough changing quite, quite, it's changing a lot. So, I mean, we'd have plenty yeah. to talk about and I'm up for that too. And maybe it doesn't, you know, the subsequent talks don't have to be three hours long. They could just maybe be an hour or something, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I really enjoy uh, the, the talking about it and maybe some people will, will learn something and, and understand maybe us a little bit better as artists. And, um, you know, Marcus, I appreciate you taking all the time and energy that you did to put this all together. I, I really appreciate it. Do you think there's anything else that we need to, button up today no uh, uh you were very welcome guys it was a little bit of a learning curve after our first test but now i think uh for today it uh, worked out really well i think this story of boris is very inspiring and you can see that ai can help uh, uh people to overcome uh the problem that they cannot go outside for example in in uh, your uh story and there's a lot of good things coming to us with AI, but there's a lot of things we can discuss. And as you guys said, maybe we maybe do it like in a two or three monthly basis and maybe a little bit shorter the next time. So my setup is ready here and we can uh, repeat that as uh, every time. So it should be, it's now an easy task. And <clears throat> and uh, we can bring some other people on yeah, as well. I sure. mean, we may yeah, get bored. Just idea. Let's, so Boris, if you run into someone who uh, would be interested to have them here. And then if I find someone that has a certain perspective, that would be, you know, a new voice. I mean, we don't yeah. want the last thing we want. I know you don't want to. And Marcus, we don't want to be sitting here talking in an echo chamber. I mean, that gets rather boring <laughs> rather quickly. So I, if we can find someone to uh, challenge us a yeah, little bit I in have our an idea ideas. Already, but uh, I talked with him, but he was too busy, but he would be a very interesting guest. So I hope I can uh, uh, talk with him again. And we have, and it's, it's, he comes from a totally different uh, category, but it could be super interesting. Okay. So to be continued and Boris, thanks for taking that. You're a very busy man. So I appreciate you taking time out. My pleasure. Well, let's do it again. And um, yeah, maybe if you uh, watch this later on YouTube and you have some questions, put it in the comments, then we can find we them. Can follow, the we can follow. We can follow that. Yeah. And then we can just document them and bring them up next time. <laughs> sounds, sounds great, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Sounds really good. Uh, so to everybody, thanks for watching us too. And thanks for your comments. There are uh, uh, some more comments, but uh, I think this was not a question. We will have a look later and maybe we just answer after we're finished right now. Uh, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to do it again. And uh, thank you guys. I'll put the stream offline now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, Boris. Bye. Bye, my friend.